at Amtrak, we are 12% behind them as of today, and by the year 2028, we'll be 50% behind them on the wage scale. We are behind Metro North by 16% today, New Jersey Transit by 11% today, and Mr. Ng knows how much we're behind Long Island Railroad. Welcome to Boston Public Radio. Uh, we are broadcasting live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews, facebook.com slash gbhnews as well. Andrea Cabral is kind enough, she's the former Secretary of Public Safety, by the way, is kind enough to be sitting in for Marjorie, who's back on Monday. Hey there, Andrea, how are you? Hello there, Jim, how are you? Nice to see you again. Uh, we are at the library on Tuesday next. That's when the Boston Police Commissioner, Michael Cox, will join us. And starting next week, as we've said to you only about 3,000 times, Marjorie and I will be broadcasting live from the library, not two days a week, but three. We're adding Wednesday. It'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you need your spirits lifted, and we all do, coming up later in this hour, Alex Avayar will join us with a Latin fusion trio that is spectacular. We heard them rehearsing ahead of a show next week at Long Live Roxbury Brewery and Tap Room. That's at the bottom of the hour. So we're going to start by extending a conversation we had earlier in the week about Israel and Gaza after these horrific reports yesterday that 100-plus civilians were killed while waiting for humanitarian aid and food delivery. The total Palestinian death count, as you know, uh, surpassed 30,000 yesterday. Is uh, uh, The Palestinians say that IDF forces opened fire on civilians at the site. Israelis say the cause of death were stamp, uh, stampede. Either way, uh, this is just totally unacceptable and horrific. I hope you agree. Our number is 877-301-8970. To call or text, we want to get your reaction to yesterday's horror, but also are you among those concerned the U.S. is not exerting enough pressure on Netanyahu to protect civilians in Gaza from this slaughter, from being starved, from a famine? 877-301-8970. Yeah, I feel almost stupid saying what I'm about to say. What was your reaction when you heard the news yesterday, Andrew Cabral? I'm at the point now where um, the sh level of sheer destruction and human civilian death is numbing. And I don't want to become anesthetized to it, mm. but it is, it is numbing to hear yet another report. And the first thing I thought, because well, we I think we were looking at it basically we at were. the same time. We were. And first of all, there are 2.3 million people living, Palestinians living in Gaza. So the, the reports are about a quarter of them. Uh, there's 80% of the 2.3 have been displaced, but about a quarter of them are starving. Mm -hmm. Now, if you know that it's been difficult to get any kind of humanitarian aid in there, but you do know that convoys are coming, and you've got a bunch of starving people, don't you think that what's going to, they're going to run for the trucks. These are starving people. And I, I don't, I'm sorry, I just don't buy this idea that these IDF uh, soldiers felt threatened by people whose only focus was to get food for themselves and their families. They simply don't have time to challenge you and your rifle. They just don't. They're going to get food. So I, I have a huge problem with it. And I think, um, you know, intelligent people make the distinction. But nobody's saying that people are in, in favor of Hamas. And no one is suggesting that Israel doesn't have a right to defend itself. But this is unacceptable. It is totally unacceptable. And I hope you agree. And if you don't, we'll welcome your call too. 
uh, 8970. And you know, when you mentioned no one supporting Hamas, I think I mentioned to you yesterday, there was a poll that was <laughs> alleged poll, excuse me, cited by Prime Minister Netanyahu saying uh, four out of five Americans are uh, 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 sympathize with Israel, not with Hamas. And as I think I said to you yesterday, what a phony analysis. Right. I don't know anybody who thinks what, you know, Hamas's savagery is in any way uh, acceptable. So he creates this false dichotomy right. and fails to ignore the fact that while people, of course, want Hamas eradicated, they don't want the Palestinian population eradicated along the way, even though that seems to be fine with him. And by the way, I have to say, uh, and I say this with great care, it seems to be fine with the government of the United States of America. I am sure Joe Biden is putting a lot of pressure privately, either personally or through his people, Jake Sullivan, National Security Advisor, these other people, on Netanyahu and the Israeli government, but it, it's not doing anything. Yesterday, there was an image last night on CNN. I mean, there's certain images. There was an image last night on CNN of a guy uh, talking to the camera, I don't know, he looked like he was 40 years old, saying, I'm just here to get flour and bread to feed my family. Uh, after he did that interview, he was killed. Uh, obviously didn't get the flower. I woke up yesterday morning. Did you see the image in the New York Times? A little baby who has no. no surviving family. A baby being held, I think, by a nurse at a hospital, one of the few hospitals that's able to serve people, has no family who are alive. It's just, it's unbelievable. It, it is unbelievable. And, and I think, you know, I, I've marveled over... Uh, a number of different situations at the kind of job that I think Antony Blinken does. I mean, I think I'm sure that when he was, you know, drafted for the job, he never anticipated that he, he'd be involved in anything like this. I think he's he works incredibly hard. I think that's he's the person, the front person that Biden has, mm -hmm. trying to move this ceasefire forward. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean, if people stop to think about how weakened Netanyahu was before this attack, and how on the verge of being ousted he was, and how it sounds crazy to say it, how this horrific attack by Hamas has empowered him to do all of this. I mean, go back and think about that and think about that's who you're really dealing with. Um, it's it's going to come down to money. It's going to come down to money and funding. And I know that there are a lot of people in this country that don't want us to take a penny away or make it a conditional ceasefire dependent upon money. There are a lot of people that don't want that, but that's the only thing that's going to move the needle. He's Netanyahu has said as much. That that basically, I'm not. I don't see. I don't see how I ever stop doing this. Is what he's basically been saying. Eight seven seven three zero one eighty nine seven. Just locally for a second. I, we've mentioned you before. The only three Democrats in the Senate who voted to impose conditions on funding for Israel, which, as you know, is not passed in the House were Merkley from Oregon, Democrats, if I didn't say that, uh, Welch from Vermont and led by Bernie Sanders from Vermont. Sanders is now saying there shouldn't be any funding, from what I understand, from the United States, the Israeli government. I am sort of surprised, and if any of you have more information than we do, and we should reach out to them, we haven't, Senator Warren and Markey, for whom I have great respect, have not gotten there yet. They've expressed concern about Israel's invasion of Gaza. They did not support conditioning aid to Israel on a either a cessation or at least uh, uh, some control of this this, in my opinion, wanton savagery uh, perpetrated by Netanyahu. I, I, you know these people, and I'm sure I'm guessing respect them a lot too. Why are they not leading the charge here? Do you think? Well, I think they're probably hearing from people who don't want that to happen, who don't who see who see the um, any sort of um, diminishing of support for Israel or a diminishment of, of funding um, as weakening an ally, and and that Israel will need mm -hmm. it. And I, unless anybody think I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm unaware or unsympathetic, um, or not deeply understanding, quite frankly, of uh, Israel's position in this and what they've been fighting, as well as the history. Um, which I'm very familiar with of anti-Semitism, uh, both you know globally and in this country, and that you're always worried that it's only you're only two or three steps away from being you know re-experiencing what you've experienced historically. I completely get all of that and understand it. Um, but I and I think that that's some of this. But I think intelligent people in this day and age have to be able to look at historical and even temporal atrocity 
and current atrocity and not say that one justifies the other. I, I couldn't agree more, and I assume everybody, I assume everybody listening, and I know you, if, we, if uh, Israel could eradicate Hamas, it'd be wonderful. The question is, can right. they eradicate it without doing what they're doing to the innocent civilian population of uh, Gaza? You know, put your and family think, in that position, and I'll tell right. you, I, I can't imagine anybody who is compassionate and human who is not feeling great pain. And I think people to some degree, at least understood the destruction of property and buildings when Israel was saying, look, the tunnels are, at, they've, mm -hmm. they've literally built these tunnels. They've been using these people as human shields for a very long time. They take their food, they take their fuel, they take everything from them, and they live underneath them mm -hmm. so that you, we can't get at them unless we destroy the structures that sit on top of these tunnels. And people watched on TV as they went into the tunnels. You could actually see they existed. That was not, None of that was made up. But these are above ground civilian killings, and that's why I think you're seeing more and more people say, look, this doesn't have anything to do with rooting out Hamas. Hamas isn't in the street starving, running after a convoy for food. That's the voice of Andrew Cabral sitting in for Marjorie Egan, who returns Monday. Now it's your turn, Bob from Brookline, your first on Boston Public Radio. Welcome. Hey, guys. I um, really appreciate the fact that you're talking about this. Um, wow, I'm hearing an echo of myself. We hear you fine, though. <laughs> Okay, I'll just ignore the echo. Good. Um, it, uh, so anyway, if you care deeply, as I do, about, you know, seeing Biden reelected and not having a Trump presidency, then the Biden administration has to do everything in its power to wield its influence to bring this carnage to an end. Because look, and sorry to make it all about politics, but look at what happened in the Michigan Democratic primary. Uncommitted got like 20% of the vote. 13. And 13. 13, okay. Still... You know, that the whole election could hinge on Michigan in November. And I know it's eight months away, but Biden could, you know, lose those voters in November if they don't solve this problem soon. And by solve, obviously, I mean wield their influence, you know, when it comes to Netanyahu and Israel and, and show that they really care about Gaza. And, uh, you know, also young people may not come out to vote for Biden. If, well, you know, um, that's a, you, if, your political concern is a good second reason. The primary reason should be because it's the right thing to do. But uh, obviously, there is a movement within the Democratic Party that is concerned. You talked to Chuck Todd about a variation right. on this yesterday. Bob, thanks for your thoughts. We appreciate it. What was the whole thing with Chuck? Well, Chuck Todd's point on Meet the Press, he was a guest on Meet the Press this past Sunday, talking to Kristen Welker and said, uh, she was sort of pressing him and saying, you know, but what about this, the, this uncommitted vote in Michigan? And his response was, if it gets over 30%, then Biden should be concerned. Um, but it's nowhere near that at this point. Also, what he didn't mention was that Michigan historically has significant numbers of uncommitted voters because you can vote uncommitted there. When Barack Obama was running and there was no war in, uh, between uh, Israel and Gaza, um, it was 40%. So... They have, they, they have that history, so you have to put the uncommitted vote into context. But his point was that, essentially, was that Trump's weaknesses are far graver than Biden's. And I, and I understand Bob's point. I understand the caller's point. Now, the polls aren't necessarily showing that level of weakness for him yet. I agree more with your, I understand his point, but I agree with yours, which is, you do this because it is the right thing to do. And on the heels of a war raged against, waged against Iraq, which had absolutely nothing to do with 9-11, but... You know, they managed to convince most of the country that they somehow did. This is, a, this is yet another, uh, you know, grand scale tragedy that America, that lo not, is not squarely at America's feet because Israel is doing it, but we're Israel's strongest ally and should have the most influence over them. I'm with you, Phil and Beverly. Welcome. Hey, uh, you know, Netanyahu is, his reason for staying in office is, will oh, have this war continue? And I think Biden, as one of the other callers just said, has got to be more adamant with Netanyahu and actually come out and call for a ceasefire. Otherwise, otherwise, this is going to go on and on. Also, the Israeli people themselves should maybe actually call for a new government. And um, the thing is, CNN or one of the uh, cable stations had recently said that Netanyahu had mentioned the possibility of his army going up into Lebanon, which is Hezbollah, and if he does that, 
you're going to have one heck of a big war going on once Hezbollah gets involved because they are one heck of a lot harder nose than uh, Hamas was. So Biden just has to be a lot stronger in this and really soon because the red line is coming when it comes to Rafah and the Palestinians. But anyway, thanks a lot. Well, and, thank uh, you. Thank well, we you. thank you for your thoughts. He did say that. Uh, 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 Netanyahu, uh, the caller is right. Uh, Netanyahu did say that. And I think his point is well taken that the people that were turning out into the streets when Netanyahu was sort of taking, you know, undercutting the judiciary and sort of changing mm -hmm. their version of, of our SCOTUS um, uh, so that he'd have more power over it, people were pouring into the streets in Israel just before this happened. Mm -hmm. And if the same number of people... Um, or a similar number, took to the streets on this, he might get a different message. But I, the point about him going into Hezbollah, I think, is very well taken. The number's 877-301-8970. Let's talk to Bill in Situate. Welcome, Bill. Hi, Bill. Hi. Um, everybody, I think we're all distressed about the horrendous situation. But did any presence of the United States have had any impact on the Israeli situation, Eisenhower. I you know, Bill, you're you're cutting out. War. You're cutting out. Are you? Uh, I think what you're saying. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Is that uh, the president has of our country has limited ability to affect the decisions of the leadership of Israel? Is that where you're going? Yes, as has every president since Eisenhower. Yeah, well, I, with all due respect, I don't uh, buy it. Uh, they need our money, they need our weaponry, and uh, I, I am somebody who just has an honest disagreement with you. I'm not a foreign policy expert. Needless to say that uh, we have a tremendous amount of power as the wealthiest and greatest ally of the state of Israel. Well, Bill, thank you for your perspective. And so I, one of our texters, it's really interesting that, uh, that Bill just made that point because one of our texters finds the, the, the distinction that makes a difference, which is the text, who is, it's an, who is, oh no, it's Brian in Cambridge, says it's important to be clear about the U.S. role here. The 30,000 dead were killed with U.S.-made bombs bought by Israel with U.S. aid dollars, and we're about to send more with only Sanders, Welch, and Merkley opposed. And that's really where the, you know, to the, your point, where the influence comes. I don't think anybody's suggesting that we can usurp Israel's sovereignty of course, to right. decide to wage right. war where, wherever they want to wage it. The issue is whether or not you interpret your allyship as aiding in something you don't believe in or this, that you think is wrong. Can I, before we take a break, I, I have a feeling, I'm guessing that some of you are feeling we're also not talking about another elephant in the room. There's a story in a publication called The Intercept that came out yesterday that is suggesting that the New York Times reporting, uh, which was hugely impactful, uh, I think, on support for what Israel was doing earlier on uh, around systemic sexual violence uh, perpetrated by Hamas against uh, Israeli women on October 7th, uh, that the reporting uh, may be flawed. And the only reason we're not talking about it today is because we wanted an opportunity to digest it more. And Monday, when Charlie Sennett joins us, we will uh, have that conversation with you. All right. So uh, Andy in Boston texts us saying, as an American Jew, it pains me to say Netanyahu is destroying Israel as he pushes to eliminate Gaza. A ceasefire is imperative, but I don't. Uh, but I also don't see a future for Israel that is anything other than considerably weakened. It's not as if successes to Netanyahu are any less right wing. And we we kind of talked about well, that's that. That's a nightmare. It's true. We did. We did. We did. We got to take a break. All right, we're going to take a break. Stick around for more of your calls and texts are next. And you're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH.
Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. Andrew Cabral is kind enough to be sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie's back on Monday, the day after Tuesday when we're at the library. The Boston Police Commissioner Michael Cox will join us here. And starting next week, as we've said, three days a week at the library forevermore. We're adding Wednesday, so it'll be Tuesday. Wednesday and Friday. Uh, we're discussing yet another unimaginably horrible day in Gaza. You've all read about it. You've all seen the video. 100 plus people killed, 700 plus at least injured. Uh, you know, and by the way, there's this debate about whether or not the IDF Israeli forces shot uh, the bulk of these people or if uh, it was a stampede as Israel calls. I, I don't think it matters that much. They are dead and they are dead because of the the, the horrible conditions under which they're forced to live. But we should add that a bunch of doctors who treated, treated, who received the dead in hospitals and morgues said uh, that many of the people who they did see uh, had been killed by uh, bullets. Right. So that at least some of the 100 plus were killed by uh, IDF forces, 877-301-8970. What's your reaction? There's still no ceasefire. Obviously, Biden said yesterday that the ceasefire that he thought was going to be announced as early as today is obviously at least temporarily on hold, even though one would argue there's now even a greater need for a ceasefire. Carolyn and Rentham. Yes, hi. Um, I, I grew up a block from the Tree of Life Cemetery. Oh. I knew people that were killed. Pittsburgh. I, um, my uh, uncle was a rabbi. I have a lot of connections to Israel. But the persecuted people do not persecute people. And this is just heinous. And I believe in my heart that Netanyahu either was aware of the impending attack or let it go through because this was his end game. This has always been his end game. And then on another note, Jared Kushner was just being awarded some crazy thing from the ADL for helping relief hostages. This intermingling between Trump and Kushner and Netanyahu is just unbelievable. That is, and that's been written about probably not enough, but, and thank you for your call, Caroline, um, but uh, I've seen more than a few pieces sort of questioning that and questioning uh, the additional relationship with Putin between Putin and Netanyahu, which also sort of involves Trump and it's this sort of, um, you know, sort of unholy alliance that uh, I don't think we're going to know nearly enough about until it's too late. 877-301-8970 is the number, Andrea. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Adam in New Hampshire. Hi, Adam. Hello, Adam. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Good. Good. So I, before talking about the 30,000 number, I'd like to give a little bit of pushback um, on those ceasefire people. So for those who are asking for a ceasefire, even regardless of whether Hamas is in charge, I need them to realize that what they're essentially saying is that they, back during World War II, they would have negotiated peace with Hitler, even if it meant the Nazi party. Well, Adam, before you continue, I'm one of those ceasefire people who is not saying anything even marginally close to that. What I am saying is I don't want to see tens of thousands of innocent Palestinians slaughtered. Number two, any ceasefire, as you know, Adam, would be conditioned upon the release of at least 40 Israeli hostages and probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 Palestinian prisoners. So please don't characterize people whose views you don't share. That's your opinion of what they think, but it's not what I think. So go ahead, Adam. Okay, so I'll, I'll skip that part. Thanks. Regardless, there are people out there that because their hearts are in the right places, wouldn't mind seeing Hamas stay in charge as long as all of this ended. That's, th th there's no doubt. Who are, who is that? I'm just curious. Who, who are the people? Me, am I supposed to name names, Jim? You know, that's a moronic response. Uh, I'm not asking you to name names. Who, who is the constituency that would like to see the people who murdered more than a thousand uh, Israelis in, in charge? You, who are you talking about? I mean, these people are, I mean, to take Twitter for what, what you want, but don't say that Twitter isn't real life. Obviously, Twitter is real life. I may have agreed with you 10 years ago, but the, unless you believe that these people are all just making up their stances. No, I mean, if, you're, if your point, my apologies, if your point is that some extremists are, or trolls, one of the two, 
are uh, saying that Hamas should be the people who lead the two plus million Palestinians, as long as there are two plus million, then you're probably right. But I, I don't think that's the sentiment of sane people. But Adam, thank you for your call. 877-301-897. Uh, uh, Again, the ceasefire. I, a temporary ceasefire. A lot of people think it should be a permanent ceasefire. Let's talk first things first. A temporary ceasefire would lead to the release of at least several dozen from what I read last time, women, probably not male hostages, held by the uh, Palestinians. So it's not a unilateral act of generosity on the part of Israel. Should they agree to it, they're going to get something in return from that. Am I? No, that's, I think that that's absolutely right. And I think um, the as this has progressed, like I said in the beginning, everyone sort of understood the need for an immediate and what was going to be a devastating response. And as this has progressed, and as at least in some areas Hamas has retreated, more questions should be asked of Israel of how they're distinguishing civilian populations from people that they believe to be involved in Hamas. And I know that they believe that there's some overlap or some, some uh, collaboration. Or, or, but, but the bottom line is, um, you still have to answer those questions and you still have to justify every time your military fires on a civilian population. I mean, the issue is proportionality. We started discussing it early on. I, I, I'll say what I said before. I think you would agree. If there was some magic way to eliminate all the leaders of Hamas so that the threat to uh, right. everyday Israelis was reduced, who would not support that? What we've learned since October 7th is there that there is no roadmap to that except through the lives of Palestinian families. Right. I mean, that's what we've seen so far. Right. So there's a point at which the objective evidence suggests, I hope, to people that there is no proportionality and there's got to be some sort of reasonable uh, um, ceasefire. Where do you want to go? Uh, let's go to, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Uh, is it Shazia in Westboro? West hey Welcome. Hi, Shazia. Yeah. Hi, Shazia. Shazia. I'm sorry. Voted, um, no, it's fine. I voted in early voting today um, on the Democratic ballot, and mm -hmm. I voted no preference mm -hmm. as a protest um, of Biden's actions, so specifically his funding of the Israeli military without any conditions and of his use of the Security Council veto. Um, against any chance for a ceasefire. Is there, um, you know, uh, I, what I, I don't know, and I should, we all know that the uncommitted thing in uh, uh, Michigan was an organized effort, a serious organized effort. So was the ceasefire vote in New Hampshire, even though it didn't do nearly as well. And we learned the other day that if you write uncommitted on a Massachusetts ballot, it doesn't count. If you write no preference, it does count. Is it organized, or is this just... A, you know, an act by you and others who may feel as you do. Is there organized effort? It's, it's, there's definitely, there's movement on social media. Okay. Um, for people who are like-minded, who have all sort of yeah, got behind this uh, movement to do no preference. What would you like to see Joe Biden do? What, what action would you like to see him take? I, I, want, I want no more funding to uh, Israel on condemnation of clear war crimes. And I don't want our Security Council vote veto being used to shelter Israel from what the world mm -hmm. wants to see, which is an immediate and permanent ceasefire. We really I think definitely sorry. using these... Sorry. No, you oh. go ahead. You go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I feel like definitely using our diplomatic um, powers to sort of shelter Israel is allowing Netanyahu to feel emboldened. He definitely feels emboldened. And he's continuing um, this mass collective punishment and forced starvation as a tool of war against innocent civilians. Really like, appreciate. I don't want my name behind that. We understand that, and thank and you I very much that, for the call. You know, there are there are. Um, um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with the complete defunding uh, of a military aid to Israel, but um, there are reasons for um, not emboldening Netanyahu that existed prior to the Hamas attack, and 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 just it's just important to not forget that. Uh, one of our texters, Linda from Hopkinton, uh, said that she believes the brutality of the response from Israel will, will encourage a new generation of terrorists. And that people talk about all the time is that when you, that baby that has no family that grows up mm -hmm. at some point, um, uh, all of that anger and that rage and that hatred is going to be turned somewhere. And, and it's not, you know, that's exactly how terrorists are born. Well, it's not only uh, breeding more terrorists, which I think is without doubt. 
is how about international support for Israel? I mean, the reality is while the United States is standing by Israel, a lot particularly of Western countries, which historically have been very supportive of Israel, uh, who are, who've been very critical and their people very critical. And when this is over, hopefully sooner rather than later, that support's gonna be weakened, which is really an unfortunate consequence of, at least in my opinion, of Netanyahu's uh, behavior. So I agree. we'll continue this uh, next week and uh, we'll continue to stay on it. And again, I, I would suggest you read The Intercept before we talk on Monday. It's an important piece. It's a very controversial piece, but check it out. You get a lot of calls and texts after people I think read we that may. piece. I think we may. <laughs> Thank you for your calls and texts today. After coming up after a quick break, it's time for Live Music Friday at the BPL with Blue Mango frontman Alex Alvear and his Latin trio. He joins us with Michael Feldman, producer of a weekly live music series in Roxbury. Stay tuned. You are listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, Jim Browdy and Mardrigan, live at the library. Well, it's not Mardrigan. Can you stop this, Jim? Yes, I can. <laughs> Let's start this over again. Thank God it's not a live show. Oh, it is a live show. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. I'm Jim Browdy. Who are you again? I'm Mardrigan. You're Mardrigan, right? <laughs> and, well, sort of Mardrigan and Andrew Cabral, I guess, live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash gbhnews, facebook.com slash gbhnews. Tuesday, we're back here with the commissioner of the Boston Police Department, Michael Cox, and Wednesday, we're here, even though we usually aren't, because next week, we start three days a week at the Boston Public Library. And now it's Live Music Friday, thank God. For 30 <laughs> years, bassist and band leader Alex Alvear made his mark on Boston's live music scene with a singular style of Latin fusion inspired by artists of his native Ecuador, plus a mix of influences including funk, jazz, and yacht rock. Wow. In any case, after returning to his home country in 2013, Alex is now back in Boston. He's getting his band Mango Blue back together for a one-night show next Saturday, March 9th, at Long Live Roxbury, obviously in Roxbury, a few blocks outside Nubian Square. For information, go to longlivebeerworks.com slash Boston. Good. The guy who owns it just nodded in agreement. It's part of a <laughs> weekly live and, should we say, free music series of Long Live Roxbury. The guy responsible for that series is here now too, Michael Feldman, who is also the CEO of something intriguing, of Feldman Geospatial, whatever that means. We'll find out in a minute. Michael, Alex, it's great to see you both. Thanks so much Good for being here. Good to see you. Thanks so Thank much, you, so, so nice to be here. Alex, your story, your journey, and it, it literally is a journey from Ecuador to here, back to Ecuador. Absolutely fascinating, your relationship with Michael and then your collaboration, your long friendship. I want to know how you pulled Mango Blue together, but to the extent that you can weave in as much of your story into that, okay. um, you know, Ecuador here and back, please do that, because this is just, you guys are going to be amazed. This is amazing. Well, it's a long story. I'll try to make it. <laughs> yeah, it's, I know. It's tough. It's a tough brief. I, I, I wanted to study at Berkeley while I was in Ecuador. I couldn't afford it, and it was a, an urgent thing to do. But I was kidnapped by the secret police of the government at that time, a right-wing government in Ecuador. 
And I literally had a week. I came with a one-way ticket to the States. And slowly but surely, I made my way to Berkeley. And uh, as we all know, the Berkeley College is a school that attracts people from all over the world. And uh, I was able to meet a lot of fantastic uh, people first, and musicians as well, from different cultures. I learned a lot of music, a lot of interpersonal relations, and uh, it was a very enriching experience for me. And it, through this process, I, I started to work with a lot of uh, Puerto Rican salsa bands, Dominican merengue bands, and uh, after a, a good chunk of time doing that, I also, uh, I started to look for my own voice within that tradition. That's how Mango Blue is born, because I'm, I'm not a salsero, you know, I'm from the Andes, I'm, I'm from Quito, Ecuador, so uh, I wasn't born and raised with this music, it was something that I, it's a train I hopped on uh, later on. Uh, so I wanted to find my own voice with all these influences. I love jazz, I love rock and roll, I love funk. and. Uh, and Mango Blue was a, an opportunity for me to bring all these elements together. And with it, I, I had already met a lot of people in the scene, and I was, I've been really fortunate. The band has about, I don't know, 15, 15 years or more of existence, and I've seen several generations of musicians come by, including some top-line uh, jazz artists like Miguel Senon, Anat Cohen, Alonia Fnai. Like you, Chimera. for example. <laughs> like, uh, well. like you. So you are really into, I mean, you have this jazz series. My understanding is Thursday nights generally. This is a Saturday night performance on March 9th. You can tell us about the series in a minute, Michael. You were totally in the Mango Blue and Alex. That's in great part why they're there Saturday, a week from Saturday, right? That's right. What's the allure? So the allure to his music for me was the first time I saw them. I was like, wow, his music defines everything I wanted in music. It was Latin music, it was funk, it was jazz. It sounded like Steely Dan, they had a saxophone section. So for me, the first time I saw them in about 1996 at Johnny D's in Somerville, for those of you who know the, the Sadly, venue, yeah. um, I was blown away. And so ever since then, I just, I guess I was a groupie, I saw him. Um, been in touch with him. Anytime he comes back, we find ways to get him to play wherever I am. Why'd you leave? Um, well, it's, it, it's a funny story. It's actually, I'm kind of embarrassed, but I, I oh, lived here. Oh, then tell us. Quick. <laughs> yeah, that's, I lived here for a very long time, I and I remember I was in a, in a reunion with some folks, and, and a guy tells me, you've been here for a long time. And I go, yeah, I've been here for a 10, no, 15. 12, 15, and then I re made the math and it was 25 years. Uh -huh. And it was like a bucket of cold water on my head. And I, I really, my main, uh, my main uh, interest was to be with my parents. They were getting old and I didn't want to receive that phone call being away. So I dropped everything and I just went back. But I also read you say that the Latin music scene was not very vibrant or welcoming when you left. No, I, I mean, no, it, what happened, I fell in love with Boston as soon as I got off the train on Newbury Street, I walked <laughs> down and there were bands playing on the street. Oops, I guess There's, I got that wrong. Yeah, that, okay. it's, it's exactly the... Oh, it is? My apologies. There were so many clubs and the clubs didn't need to know how many followers you had because they knew that the booking there was excellent. So you didn't care who played, you went and you saw some amazing music. And it's broken my heart that Boston has lost a lot of its live music scene. Um, Why do you that, think that is? I think, I think the people, the, the old school of, of uh, uh, jazz, uh, club owners uh, were really into the mystique of the music and right now everything is business and it, you make more money having a, an office building rather than a, a, mm. a, a music venue, I think, let, unfortunately, you know. So let me ask you, uh, having jumped on that train of you know, merengue and salsa and music from places where you yourself were not from, what was it like to go back to Ecuador and realize that you were home musically and find more of your voice there? Well, since my, my early uh, days in music, I always worked with fusion concoctions. Um, I did a lot of straight ahead salsa, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, traditional styles of music, but when it comes to creating, 
and to finding my voice, I've always been involved in projects that mix a lot of influences. And that started back in the 80s in Ecuador. And now that I'm back in Ecuador, I'm continuing that line. I have a band now with my son and some really fine uh, young great. musicians in Ecuador called Ubanyuk Tatonic. I know it's impronounceable, but, uh, <laughs> but what we do now is I'm going back to my, because we don't have salsa, merengue, and all that in Ecuador. We have more Indian music, Afro-Ecuadorian music. So my band is now a fusion of many, let's say, universal styles, reggae, rock, jazz, blues, uh, and Andean music. Uh, indigenous music. You know, Michael, you're uh, at least part of the antidote to what uh, Alex was just describing about sort of a declining music scene. So why are, you, why are you in that position? What do you see in that others have not? Well, first of all, we need it. I mean, the last segment proves that we need some things that make us feel good. We That's do. to begin with. We do. Our business moved to Roxbury in 2016. We were mature enough that I could spend some of my time with community and so this year we decided our community impact project is going to be we're going to bring live jazz music to our tenants brewery um, downstairs in our building and then really activate the space, get community members in, see how it goes. In two months, we've seen last night there were about 90 people in there smiling, having a great time. The musicians were playing. Somebody came and sat in. And it was like, wow, this was like going to Wally's Jazz Cafe, I don't know, 30 years ago. So, so, so is it, it successful? I mean, obviously it's successful from a musical perspective. I can see from the smile on your face. Is it financially successful? And if it is, why is it not being replicated elsewhere? Well, here's the trick in our situation. We are not making money on this program. We, we're spending money. You don't we care? Make, no way, because we make money upstairs in our engineering business. And the community wow. needs it. So we're spending money to not only activate the space, but, you know, honestly, if our tenant does well, we're going to do well, too. Um, and the way we want to pay the musicians and have it work, um, last night we could have made some money if we took all of the revenue from the brewery and then paid the band. So you could say it works. But for us, seeing what I saw last night and what's going on in there now, uh, it's paying for itself. Yeah, speaking of the brewery, by the way, what's in the pink bag, if you're watching on TV or here, tell people what's in the bag. They think we're going to be, what's in the bag? So if you'd like, we can do a beer tasting, but instead we could just hand Nothing it like off Nothing like having you. a beer at 11 a.m. That's so, my motto. <laughs> yeah, so long live. On a live radio show, particularly. Go ahead. Great. So long live um, Beer Works. Their, their first place was in Providence. Now they're in Boston, in Roxbury. Um, they sent a, a gift for you guys to share oh, to four nice. packs. I was walking out the door with them in my hands, and my wife grabbed this beautiful pink pastel bag. Um, <laughs> that I said, do I really need to do this? But um, she's amazing, because without her, I, I would not look this good. Well, one, <laughs> it's very generous. I don't think we're going to be having one at 11.30, <laughs> but we will have one later, Andrea. I'm, I'm just mindful of, of Alex having to go over for our yeah. first song. Um, but who are I, these guys? Do you want to ask who his player is? Yeah, player? let's introduce the band, and then I want to talk to, uh, to um, Mike about his location. Great. I'm very familiar with it. So tell us who you're playing with, and then you can join them while we talk to Michael. First. Sure. Uh, I have the pleasure of playing with my, my compadre, my brother, my uh, one of my best friends in, in, in the world, Mr. Manolo Mairena. Yay! From, from Costa Rica, a fantastic singer, percussionist, composer, and uh, I just love this guy a lot. And we also have uh, Aníbal Cruz, a great Cuban player residing now in the, in the Boston area. You don't love him, or you what? Do you love him too, or no? <laughs> well, I, 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 I love him too, not as much as this, because well, I, I just, okay, I just met him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so what are you going to play, and then join your colleagues? We're, we're going to do two things. We're going to play one song that uh, is kind of one of the many influences in the music uh, that, that I do with Mango Blue. And the next one is a song by Mango Blue, uh, that I wrote for Mango Blue. Oh, fabulous. Kind of a trio version, because Mango Blue is an eight-piece band. Gently put your headset down while you join your colleagues, and we'll talk to Michael for a second while you're setting up. So, Michael, you're in, am I correct that the building that you're in is the old piano factory? So yeah, in, in 1856, we believe it was built. It spent two years as the Boston Piano Factory. They manufactured pianos in there, but from what I could gather from research, they weren't enough that they had serial numbers on them, so I couldn't track them down. There were other industrial uses after that. And it was lofts. I, I think at one point, uh, for a long period of time, artists 
uh, both, I think, worked and lived there. But I lived on Tremont Street just a few blocks down for years and years and years. And so I, I just wanted to make the comment that South End is pretty, pretty gentrified, but there's still such community there. And what you're bringing with the brewery and all of this live music is going to help to sort of rejuvenate that. I'm, I'm just very glad that you're doing it. Okay, I got to hold your answer. Can you wait? You hold your answer? Well, quickly, quickly. Just quickly. So the, the piano factory in the South End is a different building than where we are in Newmarket. Just oh, to, just so you're on the up. other end. So okay. we're on the other end, right outside okay. the, the South End in Newmarket. Can you work out the location? Yeah, with we Andrew can work that. No, I know that. I know that location well too. <laughs> well, here's what we've been waiting for, gentlemen. Take it away. Y es que pastora la tiene conmigo, señores, tú ves, guanare, yeah, yeah. pastorita tiene guanare conmigo. Ah, yo no sé por qué será, pastorita tiene guanare conmigo, yo no sé por qué será. Que se fuera conmigo a beber I totally screwed up the time, and you're going to be playing again in a, in a minute. So this is a free deal again? Is that what the deal is? This is free for everyone. We want the community to come. We want them to feel the way I just felt watching these guys play. It's fabulous. Music. March 9th, Saturday, March 9th. Please. Thursday night, your jazz series is a weekly kind of thing? Yeah, every Thursday night from 6 p.m. to 8, um, 8.30, the music plays. Alex will also be with a smaller group. Um, I believe Manolo's there, too, next Thursday, March 7th. Next week is all Spanish music. We're super excited. But on March 9th, it's all of Mongo Blue. Yep. All 15 or whatever. Alex, you're... How many? Eight? Eight's still a lot. Eight is still a lot. That is on March 9th. And by the way, my apologies. I totally screwed up the time. So, gentlemen, you ready for the number? Second hit? Second one? Okay, here it is. Here they are. Manolo, Anibal, and Alex. A mini version of Mongo Blue. Take it away. <laughs> I saw 
song for all the migrants in the world. Escucha bien lo que te digo No sé por qué no quieres ser mi amigo Tienes esta tierra para trabajar Sin embargo tú me quieres desplazar Malas semillas hay en todo lado Sí señor Porque pagan el precio siempre lo son ¿Cómo no? Yo no te pido tu caridad No señor Solo quiero una oportunidad It's an immigrant nation Tengo esperanza de que todo aún no se ha perdido Busquemos juntos una solución Trabajando unido para convivir en comprensión Mi gente tiene mucho que ofrecerte Sí señor Si tú quisieras yo puedo ser tu pana fuerte ¿Cómo no? Yo no te pido tu caridad que va mister No señor Yo solo quiero una oportunidad It's an immigrant nation An immigrant nation Immigrant nation I work hard for my money So don't you put the blame on me Talking about Cause your own people They had to take the same route And then asking for your charity No señor All I want is opportunity It's an immigrant nation Immigrant nation It's an immigrant nation Immigrant nation Immigrant nation Immigrant nation Just Absolutely fabulous. fabulous. Wow. All right. We needed we, that. We absolutely did. That was fantastic. We've been listening to Alex Alvear. If you want to catch the reunion of his band, Mango Blue, please head to Long Live Roxbury Brewery on Saturday, March 9th, 7 p.m. Reminder, no tickets. Just like the library here, no <laughs> tickets are required. For information, go to longlivebeerworks.com slash Boston. Thank you all. And thank you, Michael. It was great. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thanks so much. Really After the new it. news, we're going to be here with our uh, Friday All Stars, GBA, one of our, the first of our Friday All Stars. GBH is Callie Crossley. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH.
It's really shameful that a deal was on the table, a deal that would have addressed and corrected so much of, the, uh, so much of this um, and fixed a broken immigration system. And the fact that a few um, Republicans were uh, unwilling to not follow the instructions of a former president is, uh, is really shameful. They've been right in the middle of the shipping lanes. To have them surface feeding in that area increases the risk of a potential vessel interaction for them. Welcome to hour number two of Boston Public Radio. We're live at the Boston Public Library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Andrew Cabral, former Secretary of Public Safety for the Commonwealth, is in for Marjorie, who is back on Monday. Hello, Andrea. Uh, you should have just said I was Marjorie. Well, I have done that 11 <laughs> times in a row. I figured I'd break the streak. Hello, Andrea. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Jim, I thank said you. Hi, Marjorie. By the way, before we continue, I want to recognize two of the finest dancers I have ever seen during Mongo Blues. Solaire Williams, age three. Where's Solaire? Hello, Solaire. Hi, Solaire. And Paige Smith, age seven, I think, with mom, I hope I pronounced it right, Shalea Niles from Medford. Is that right? You guys were fabulous, by the way. You, everybody loved it. So thanks for helping us out there. We really appreciate it. <laughs> On Tuesday, we'll be here. He'll be dancing too, I'm sure. Michael Cox, police commissioner of Boston, will be at the library. And starting next week, we're going to be here three days a week. We're adding Wednesday to our schedule, so it's Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're joined now at the desk by Callie Crossley. Callie, of course, the host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley. You can catch that Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6 o'clock. You can also hear her Callie commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. She's also, of course, the co-host for GBH is terrific, The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock right here on 89.7. Hello, Callie Crossley. Hey, Hello, Jim. Callie hey Crossley. How are you? Good I am you. well. So, uh, Callie, you tell me what happens if, uh, if a 22-year-old from Massachusetts who pleads guilty to stealing and disseminating classified information gets more time than a former president who stole more and disseminated more. I, that's an excellent question. I, 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 it looks like we're getting ready to see, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah. With so the, what's going on with, and his, and his last name is Texera. 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 If you're in, if you're, that's just a Portuguese last name. I, he's from Fall he's, River. Oh, I grew up right. in East Providence. Oh. It's Texera. Texera. Nationally, they pronounce it Teixeira, which I guess is a Brazilian is Portuguese it? pronunciation. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Drives yeah, Marjorie yeah. nuts, too. Yeah, yeah I know. I she's, from, she's from, she's from, she's yeah. from, I think, uh, Taunton yeah. or Fall River. North Titan. North Titan. Right. Oh, no, Marjorie's from Fall River. Right. Right. Yeah. But, yeah, and that's this how guy's she, from, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's yeah. the deal with this guy? Is pleading guilty? Yeah, he cha he's changing his plea. <clears throat> I'm fascinated by why, but I don't, I don't know what that's about. But anyway, he's changing his plea. Um, he had given up all of these classified documents. He set up a website, well, I don't know if it's called a website, but uh, a platform by, uh, which was very attractive to people who were on... Um, certain other platforms in social media called Discord. He would just loaded because he had access. He, had, he was cleared for classified documents, so he ac put all these really serious classified documents, like what's going on with Russia and Ukraine, for example, um, on this. Um, then he added his commentary about them on the same site and got very popular. 
Um, he also is a person who is an anti-Semite and anti-black, so you know he enriched his commentary with that and drew some other folks, particularly young people, to him. Um, and you know, it took him a while to catch him, and they caught him, and they charged him, and he pleaded. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. He initially pleaded not guilty, and then he's changed his plea. Um, and so we would assume, as uh, Andrea says, that there would be much jail time. Well, you know, it seems to me, and correct me, you're the former prosecutor mm -hmm. in this threesome, when, when uh, Callie just said, it, you know, who knows why he changed his plea, he faced 60 years in jail. Yeah, yeah. I assume the prosecutor is no him a shorter right. sentence, right? Yeah. I mean, he isn't that it. what's likely? He did it right. out in the open, right. and he, and he had a, a video it. game group. Right. Yeah, and he bragged. So right. he has, he could go to trial if he'd want to, if he wants to, but then the 60 years becomes more of a reality if he goes to trial. But for me, the question about, the, that in what you, in, uh, in your response that you raised was, it took them a while to catch him because right. another part of the story is the supervisors who knew and did nothing. Yeah, now, I, listen, I, this, is, this gets curiouser and curiouser, as they say. So I'm not, I'm not following that either. And I'm trying to just, I'm still back to why would he change his plea? What, 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 from, from a legal because perspective. Because going, I, I'm sure, I mean, his family's been very involved with him. Yeah. Going, going to, if you go to trial, if you're indicted by the U.S. Attorney's yeah. Office, <laughs> you always have the option to go to trial. If you go to trial and you are convicted, any chance that, you, by then the, the, mm. the guidelines kick in after trial. Okay. So a maximum sentence, you know, or something close to it is, mm. is very much a possibility. If you take responsibility uh, and you plead guilty, then you're able to actually have some conversation about what the sentence will be with the AUSA, and you may be able to present something jointly to the judge. Assistant but, but, U.S. Attorney, would that be uh, okay? Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's going to be 60. I don't see I could get less than 30. I mean, this is... We're talking about... What are you, like a sentencing expert no, no, or something? What are, no, because I'm looking at what he posted. No, it serious. Was, one I of the mean, great I, leaks. I just... Yeah. Well, that's uh, why I opened with what I opened. Yeah, it's like right. if he, whatever he gets. Right. And then you look, at, you look at the case down in Florida. But I think most people plead. I mean, the U.S. attorney does not go to trial very often. Mm -hmm. And that's because by the time the indictment is done, you are locked up as tight as you possibly can okay. be, and All right. most people plead guilty. Speaking of the case in Florida, I'm assuming, Nicole, who I'm looking at, there is still no trial date set in the Florida situation. The judge there, who is, oh to say, God. a friend of Trump, <laughs> right. uh, uh, is going to set a trial date, and w we may have it before the end of the show, but we don't have it at 12-11. So the dream of most young lawyers mm -hmm. is to get a clerkship mm -hmm. on the Supreme Court of the United States, and this fine young woman, Crystal Clinton, <laughs> is lucky enough to be uh, clerking for, I know, uh, Andrea's favorite justice, Clarence Thomas. So uh, w tell us a little bit about Ms. Uh, Clan. How did uh, she get there? Well, uh, <laughs> she apparently got there by uh, way of Clarence Thomas's wife, Virginia, because she worked with her. Mm -hmm. um, she went to law school. Uh, well, not obviously, because that doesn't necessarily <laughs> track. I would hope it would at the Supreme Court. But she went to law school, apparently did well. But... Um, she's most known for her statements that she made um, uh, in 2017 in which she wrote, I hate black, black people, like F them all, I hate blacks, end of story. I would have thought that would have been the end of story to be hired <laughs> as a Supreme Court clerk, but, and of all people, for Clarence Thomas, but... Well, I don't know about no, that. He says, I, uh, his quote is, I know Crystal Klan and I know bigotry. And I think we can all agree he knows bigotry. Uh, and he is... Oh, we can? I, I think, <laughs> well, yeah, I think he does know it, as a matter of fact, because he is a bigot well, as far as I am. Uh, oh, okay. oh, you're looking at it that way. I'm oh, saying, yeah, I, I'm saying I, apparently he can't recognize it. <laughs> and he worked with Ginny Thomas, the insurrectionist, right. as people know, yes, at Turning Point USA, yeah. which is a right-wing right. lunatic <laughs> operation that's big pro... Trump. It's uh, run by Charlie thing. Kirk. Yeah. Oh, it is. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that. Oh, Charlie okay. Kirk. You know, Mr. I I can't get on a plane if I if I go to the airport and I see that the pilot is black. I really have problems getting on the plane because yeah, you know, uh, that's the level issue. of incompetence. The plane is likely to go down. But he just he recently was suggesting that executions should be televised and that young people should be watching them. He's a he's a notorious 
to call him a bigot is actually an insult to regular bigots. He's just so <laughs> on steroids. By the way, and that's when Jimmy, Jimmy Thomas was a board, right. a, a, an advisory board member, right. member for Turning Point USA. And this Clanton woman, I, I'm a great believer in apologies, and my understanding is she's never apologized for no, anything. She's never, correct? She says she doesn't never, remember not, sending right. the okay, test. Okay. Right, right. Which again, the documentation is there, um, so there's no question that she sent it. And here we are. I'm like, really? Yeah, I, I, and, he, and he seems happy to have her. I mean, I will say, if you remember on Thursday, we were talking about the Alabama decision uh, yes. during my segment. And the, the judge who wrote that, for the Alabama Supreme Court judge who wrote that decision is named Jay Mitchell. They're elected, judges are elected, yeah, even on the Supreme right. Court in Alabama. Mm -hmm. He has on his campaign page, he brags about the fact that, uh, among other things, uh, he brags about the fact that two of his clerks are now at the Supreme Court are going to clerk for his hero, Clarence Thomas. Oh. This is three, because this woman clerked for right. at Alabama's uh, district right. court judge. Yes. These are coveted jobs. Positions. There are yeah. three from Alabama alone from coming from conservative judges going to clerk for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that do the bulk of the writing of the decision. So when people talk about, you know, a MAGA majority, Think about the fact That's that their right. clerks are of like mind, and these people are even younger than the justice who is, justices who are sitting. I like to think about, because she has so much dignity and poise, what is that conversation in the hallway past Judge Katanji Jackson? <laughs> I just want to envision it. I just want to envision it on two levels, first to her and then to Clarence. I mean, I just want her to say, really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> you know what's you interesting? Know. Out of the blue, for the last two days, everybody on the show who refers to Thomas has called him Clarence. Oh. I, that's never happened here before. I don't know if something happened. Was there an edict that came down? You're, you're yeah. only getting Clarence because we're on the air. That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Beautifully put. A hand for okay, Andrea. Thank that, you. Thank okay, you. Fine. And thank you. <laughs> okay. So enough of that. And by the way, when you say it's a coveted position, for those who don't know, not only is it prestigious, you're basically fixed for life. Yes. That's you clerk right. for a Supreme Court justice. Yes. That's there is right. virtually no job that is not no available to you. No door is closed exactly. to you. Exactly. Right. It's huge. In the legal right. profession. Yeah. So uh, let's come back to uh, New England. And in Vermont, they are doing what I so attempted to do in my ill-fated one term on the Cambridge City Council, is allow 16 and 17-year-olds to vote in local elections. This is in Brattleboro. What's the rationale and what's your position on this? Well, their rationale is, I guess it's about time. Um, it turns out it's happening in some communities in Maryland as well, which I thought was interesting. But they'll be voting for the president in November. Um, I just think they feel like it, you know they're they're equipped to do it. I a little bit worry about that because I think about 16-year-old me, and I was very serious on some subjects and the other ones. I'm, I'm not so well, let me tell you something. You know? I'm not. I, I think they can <laughs> yeah, vote in local elections. I'm yeah. not 100% sure yeah. they can vote in federal yeah. elections. But regardless, my attitude is: what better? We're all talking about how civic education is is a miss in this country. Right. I find teenagers, frankly, to be more engaged and better informed than a lot of the adults uh, I have to deal with. I think the notion to have them, and this is my rationale when I failed in the city council. By the way, Marjorie would tell the story, so since she's here, I feel an obligation. When I was in the city council and proposed 16 and 17 year olds vote, it was defeated. The next term, when I wasn't in the city council, it passed eight to one. Now that may say something, I'm not sure. And the legislature, of course, did not approve it because they don't approve anything like that. And by the way, an interesting Interesting factoid. Do you know who was the local elected official who was responsible for that community in Maryland being the first community in America that allowed 16 and 17 who? year old votes? Jamie Raskin. Oh, and now that's the tracks. brilliant yeah, that's constitutional tracks. Yeah, scholar. In the, but I, I don't. Well, how but do I just feel want to point out that the, 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 of these 16 and 17 year olds for the local, if they turn 18, they can vote. Oh, if they turn 18, yeah, yeah. of course, okay. yeah, so the presidential. Still, yeah. Where are you on this? Yeah. Are you concerned about it? I think it's fabulous. I don't really see the downside, and I think it makes sense. You know, if you get people registered to vote in local elections mm -hmm. early, they're thinking about voting at 16 and 17. So at 18, it's like, oh, of course, I'm, you know, I've been voting. I've been voting since I was 16, right. at least in local elections. And I agree with the, you know, the elimination of civics. Anything we can do to get people more engaged, although to your point, maybe at 16, what you're basically showing up for is to vote against whoever your parents wanted. That, I, that may be true. I will say that, you know, there are the studies that I always refer to about if your parents or a loved one or someone took you to the polls, Absolutely right. you know, then you have the habit. Um, and you can be any age to do that. 
And so I'm going to guess that a bunch of these, the 16 and 17 year olds that actually follow through, not just register, will be those that have already been engaged, even just by going to the polls with their folks. You know, but well, by, by the way, one little mm -hmm. local note that's uh, relevant is your former boss, uh, Deval Patrick, mm -hmm. when he was governor, signed a law, I, I'm quite sure I'm going to get this right, is while 16 and 17 year olds can't vote, they can register to vote as a 16 or 17 year old That's if true. they'll be 18 by right. uh, the next election. Mm -hmm. So the notion is you so don't have don't to wait till you're 18. Right, right. And you don't, exactly, you don't miss yeah. a window. So I believe that's the state of the law. And if you have a kid or you are one of those kids and you are going to be 18 mm -hmm. in time to vote, that's true. either, well, obviously it's too late for the primary, but the final in November, uh, uh, make sure you register. Or if you're the kid, make sure you go register. We're talking to Kelly mm -hmm. Crossley. So, Kelly, um, the Senate has made maybe five or six tries um, at getting uh, a, an updated, inclusive mm. sex ed bill um, uh, through the legislature completely, and it, it's been rejected every single time. Credit to Sal Domenico who, who keeps pitching, uh, and I think Jim O'Day in the House filed a, a similar bill. What's going on with the latest incarnation of this bill? Well, it's going up again um, for a vote, and... I hope this time it looks like it's pretty good. A couple things. We did a segment on this for Under the Radar, and one of the things that struck me, so I just don't quite understand the opposition, parents can opt out. You know, some of the, you can say, I don't want my kid having this, and I think that's a mistake. That's just my opinion about it. Um, the other thing to know is that you hear sex education and people go, Whoo! What are they talking about? They're, it's so old that some of the basics that you wouldn't even think about making certain that people understood clearly are not a part of the current legislation. And so they can't be taught um, or they haven't been taught. And kids are out here with no information, just some foundational information. So I'm hoping, and it seems, when I had my conversation with the folks who were uh, really pushing this was about last year, and their thought was a lot has changed as people realize, you know, just a foundational information is important. And we're not trying to, you know, bring your kid over to the dark side with some, you know, woo-woo sex education. But it's inclusive. It, it's, yes, it's, it's very it much inclusive. It talks about a yeah. variety of different types right. of identities and relationships. Exactly. Can I do a big however here, by well, the way? Because sure Marty and I did a segment on this too. This is good however. The good part of this is it requires, which is incredible that it does require this, is sexual education uh, use, quote, medically accurate research-based materials. That's good. But that's don't only, only mm -hmm. if your community already includes sex education in the curriculum. What this does not touch upon, and I think the reporting, frankly, is not very good here, with all due respect to those who reported on it, if you do not have sex education in your community, which I would argue is probably the community that needs it most, this has no application. So let's do that again. Yes. You have sex education, I, I, here are the rules, it's a good idea. You don't have sex education, and this does nothing to ensure that the kids in your schools will get it. And, Why aren't they just going for the whole nine two, yards? Parents can opt out. So even, uh, even Exactly. So well, I, I think they're not going the whole nine yards because it's taking them, what, this is the fifth time? No, uh, uh, <laughs> so, but why, but so, and, so, and the Speaker of the House has said in this Herald story that he will, he will ensure that it dies there yet again. Can you give me a grown-up objection to this being mandated for all 351 cities no, and towns? No, there is none. There no, is none. No, but, you, but you, you know, this is one of those situations where let's just get something that's accurate out oh, there in position. some communities and then hopefully by a little bit of political osmosis, something will change when they realize people who got the education didn't come out with two horns on their heads or, you know, are running around lascivi lasciviously. Well, I the word are, is, are parents you know. allowed to opt out to the existing curriculum? I don't know I don't that. Know I can't remember. I that. don't think they I are. I think I it's just been that. around for yeah. so long. That yes. So these yeah. amend. That's what. That's yes. what I focused on. Yeah. Is the amendments yeah. that allow parents to opt out have got to be related to the LGBTQ yes. part of this. Probably. Yes. Because yes. Br oh, and say yeah, with Senator Bruce good. Tarr, he's a Republican. Yeah. He filed this. If you all these years have not filed an right. option to opt out for the existing sexual sex education curriculum or for abstinence only curriculums mm -hmm. could parents opt out of those 
then why are you saying parents have a right no, to opt out right. here and it's only because this is inclusive? Yeah. And that to me is the key to it. You know, yeah. you're a former government official, high, state official of high rank. Can we agree on that? You were. <laughs> it never felt that way, but okay. You know, there is this notion on Beacon Hill that we can't mandate things for cities and towns except when we can mandate things, right. uh, you know, whatever. And they're, they're very, they want to mandate curriculum things, even those things that I think are pretty important. Give me an argument, another one, give me an argument as to why Beacon Hill should not require that every city and town have comprehensive, medically accurate, research-based materials in a okay, sex education. you're confusing what should happen with politics. What is the politics? <laughs> who, who is the opposition in did, Massachusetts? What, what did you just say? Well, you, 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 Bruce Tarr is a very nice guy. <laughs> there are. That's one yeah. senator. There are four Republicans, maybe three in the whole damn Senate out of 40 people. Yeah, still. You, you just don't, you know, right. if, you don't, if that's a blowback you don't have to get, why would you get it? Save it because for the times the you're right going to get. Well, I get that, but I'm... How are we're living in this world? <laughs> That's, yeah, I am not yet. Maybe I will someday. I mean, it's just, it is. And by the way, uh, Sal Di Domenico is a really good uh, state senator, in my opinion. And I assume he's doing what you said. I'm getting what I can because we don't have it now. Right. And maybe we'll get our foot in the door. But this is disgraceful. It's I, just, it, just do sure it. it is. It's disgraceful sure it is. for how old what is in place now. Um, and it's so irrelevant. It's not irrelevant it, totally, but just... The fact that it could be where uh, part of the civic education, actually, if you want to think about it like that. In politics, you never yeah. wade into an un yeah. what you perceive to be an unnecessary fight. But I, I'm sorry, I'm can I prolong exactly this for two I seconds? Said. I know you're both aggravated with me. <laughs> I'm but not aggravated. Who I'm is the constituent? <laughs> who out there? These are a relatively sort of representative <laughs> sampling of people. Does anybody have a problem with your kid, or if you are a kid, your kid, having medically accurate research-based materials for sex education in your public schools? Don't be embarrassed. If you're against it, raise your... I mean, nobody's... I mean, it's ridiculous. It is totally man and woman and person up and do the damn right thing on a really critical issue for young people. But and so of, they don't get the, it from the internet or some porn site, you know? Yeah. None of the people that you're trying to get at with your argument right. are sitting here watching. That's, That's correct. That's but correct. they That's do true. vote and they do call their legislators to, to, to complain. And so if you're, yeah, I agree with you completely, but if you're... Uh, on Beacon Hill mm -hmm. and you're already fighting the fight over the gun bill because you've got some Second Amendment folks right. that are telling you that they're not going to vote for you or you're fighting over a tax thing or you're this you it, it is it is and the way that it happens is that there's just inaction it's inertia mm -hmm. as a, it's like right. an act of, of, of omission versus any act of commission an affirmative objection to it they just let it go well the last thing i'll say and then you can tell us what you're doing sunday night and i promise <laughs> i'll shut up after this you know you said and i agree with both of you it's probably the lgbtq plus piece of this i believe if i remember it was a long time ago we just elected the first open lesbian governor in a landslide in massachusetts so yeah 30 percent maybe of the people in the state uh, uh, opposed her either on policy or maybe they didn't like her sexual orientation. It's a minuscule percentage, the opposition that you're describing a minute ago. Jim, this, well, a I few years I, ago, yeah. we elected the first black president, and look what the blowback right. was. Well, say that's that. a fine Thank point. Thank you. Okay. I would just say that's, you know, people have a, a, a really great ability to compartmentalize. Right. Maybe they do. Yeah. <laughs> okay, what are you doing Sunday night, uh, Kelly Crossley? We're devoting the full hour to Asian representation in films. It actually oh, increased Asian representation in films, streaming, TV. Um, we've been since the, the big breakout hit, Crazy Rich Asians. Mm -hmm. um, we've been following every year just looking at what, how that has developed. And it went from like 0.4% to 15%. I know that's not huge, but it is huge when you start talking about imagery and themes authentic themes we're talking about in movies. So aside from the fact that, you know, Past Lives uh, is in uh, up for Best Picture and the director, first time director, there are so many other um, films and streaming shows out there like Warrior and, and um, Beef to talk about both. Beef uh, is great. Beef is great. I have to tell you, great. Warrior is outstanding. And it was not anything I ever would have watch but there's so much good rich material so we're sampling what's out there now Fabulous. and of course it's ahead of the oscars so we're looking at that as well excellent yeah everything everywhere all at once i know that's right good to see you good to see you, good to see you kelly thanks yeah. so much <laughs>
We've been speaking with Callie Crossley. She's the host of Under the Radar with Callie Crossley, which you can catch Sunday nights right here on 89.7 at 6 o'clock. You can also hear her Callie commentaries on Mondays for GBH's Morning Edition. And she's co-host of, of GBH's The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock on 89.7. Thanks, Callie. After a quick break, GBH's Jared Bowen joins us to talk about some local art you won't want to miss and this story about the Boston great Donna Summer and a new legal mess with none other than Kanye West. You have to hear that. Jared Bowen is next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Uh, whoops. <laughs> See? I mean, it's ridiculous. Yeah. That's, a, that's okay. Okay, let's start again. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Andrea Cabral, thank you for your help. Sitting in for Marjorie again. Marjorie's back on. Hello, Andrea. Nice to see you. Nice I knew who you were. You We're live at the library, streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News, facebook.com slash GBH News. Tuesday, the police commissioner of Boston is with us, and Wednesday is our first regular Wednesday. We'll be here three days a week. We're joined now by Jared Bone, GBH News Executive Arts Editor and host of The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock right here in 89.7. Hello, Jared Bowen. It's great to be with you both. Great to see Hello, you. Hello, Jared. Well, um, we got the news uh, this week that uh, Richard, a I think it's a bath. Abbott. Abbott. Yeah. Okay. okay. Abbott. Um, had died, and he actually was fairly young. Um, he was the guard at the Isabella Stewart Gardner <laughs> Museum who let in the two people posing as police officers. Tell us a little bit about what his life was after that robbery, because I actually didn't really know much about him, hadn't, didn't realize the degree to which this impacted his life. Well, he had delivered the fact that he was the one who let these two police officers in and that he had intense... Alleged police Alleged, officers, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, and he had intense scrutiny on him from federal investigators for the rest of his life, basically. Uh, and so after this theft happened, he moved on. He had been a student at Berkeley, actually. He was a musician in Boston. And this kind of fed into the narrative, too, that you had somebody who was known for getting high and for drinking sometimes, uh, as it was reported, did that at the Gardner Museum, so that factored into what happened. The fact that he had let his friends into the museum one night to have a party, that had happened. So by this night, uh, which was St. Patrick's Night, and night, St. Patrick's Day night in uh, 1990, when these two alleged police officers came knocking on the door, by the way, while another guard had just conveniently gone on his rounds, so then you just have this remaining young as he was described, hippie guard known for drinking and, and smoking pot, opening the door, letting the police, again, dis disguised police officers in. They duct tape his face in a very, very strange way. Yeah, he had a lot of hair. A lot of hair. Uh, and then they spend, the thieves spend 81 minutes in the museum, which many people have wondered, if you're rushing in to steal art, why would you uh, take such license and, and such liberties and at the risk of getting caught to spend 81 minutes? The other really confounding aspect of this is that the, uh, the motion detectors at the time, this was yeah. a long time ago, this was before they were able to upgrade and really have decent museum security, the motion detectors never showed the thieves going into the room where the Manet uh, existed and where it was stolen, but he had been in that room. So for all of these reasons, there was a lot 
of scrutiny on him for the rest of his life. He eventually tried to move to, he did move to Vermont, tried to be quiet, did ultimately talk about it to some degree over the years with NPR, with the Boston Globe and others, uh, but always insisted that it was a huge regret that he had let them in, that he had nothing to do with it. And yeah, he was pretty young. He was 57 when he died this week. Okay, can we go back to the, uh, and first of all, did you say this in addition to letting the alleged cops in, which violated museum policy, he also opened a side door earlier at some point, I yeah. think for undefined reasons. The thing I never have understood, and I'm not as obsessed with this, maybe because I wasn't born here, even though I was here then, as almost everybody else in Massachusetts is, and everyone knows it's the largest and we haven't recovered the, the goods, so to speak. Isn't the motion detector evidence, like you're the prosecutor, guilty as charged. I know they didn't charge him, so obviously the prosecutors felt it wasn't enough, but when the motion detector only detects one person in the room, not the alleged cops, but Abbott, and uh, one painting stolen from that room, am I right about that? Just the Manet, yeah. The Manet stolen from the room. What was the explanation? I did, it wasn't me? Well, it's, I mean, this is what makes this, I think, so compelling and what draws in so many people and why so many books have been written and the documentaries that have been made because nothing makes sense here. Is it really coincidence, everything that I just described, that he just happened to do this, that they just happened to arrive when the other guard was gone? Did he just happen to mistakenly let them in? Did he just mis happen to have been in that room alone? But the federal investigators have obviously been looking into this for a really long time and they have found, they ultimately found no reason to ever charge him. $10 million reward. $10 million. And $1.2 billion in art. It's, it's what I, it's now valued can at. Can I ask one more question? I don't want to misquote this person. I know you'll know. You know Anthony Amore. We all know Anthony Amore. The security guard there, he ran for auditor against Diana DiZaglio mm -hmm. on the Republican ticket. I am 90% sure he has said on one of my former television shows and, th and this show, uh, yes, they know who uh, did it, but yeah. they can't. Is that what he says? They know who did it? The, the FBI said that in their own oh, they do? press conference about 10 years ago. They said they know who did it, and they were able to trace those paintings down to the mid-Atlantic coast, and then the trail went cold. And that's the problem now, is that because it's been, what, 34 years, if I'm doing my math correctly, then a lot of people who knew what happened are dead now. Well, can I just for a second, not to belabor this particular story, but play devil's advocate. So I can't explain why his his you know, uh, the motion sensor detects his uh, being in that room. But he also makes the perfect dupe. As between him and the other security guard who leaves and walks away from the only place that has the alarm, he's, this is a guy who's at Berkeley. He's getting high, he's bringing his friends in. He's perfect. So if you do want to make Claire, sure that you have on my one... jury, let me tell you right now. <laughs> I'm just saying that if you're looking at it's it true. that way, it's yeah. there's the Occam's razor, mm -hmm. which is the guy who mm -hmm. was in the room where the painting is stolen, yeah. you know, he, he's probably the one. But you can also, if you cast a wider net, he is the perfect patsy to set up for someone who was uh, colluding with the actual thieves versus the other security guard or another third person. That's true, too. Yeah. And since the FBI knows who did it but never arrested him, you know, maybe they may not have been able to prove it was him if they thought it was him, but, you know, they hounded him for his entire life and they never got any further. Do you know who did it? No. Okay. So can we talk about one other theft? <laughs> if I did, I would be $10 million right, no, richer. And he important. wouldn't be standing here talking to us. <laughs> well, just checking. Okay, this is a theft not quite of the same magnitude. Everybody knows the great Donna Summer, uh, obviously. And apparently Kanye West, now known as Ye, yeah. well, tell the story, allegedly is, uh, has taken one of her songs, I Feel Love. We'll play both versions in a minute, but tell the story. Yeah, so Kanye just, or Ye now, has just come out with a new album that, by the way, has topped the top, the Billboard 200 charts for two weeks now. And just as a little bit of background, and this feeds into the Donna Summer um, kerfuffle, is that Kanye has proven to be uh, an anti-Semite, uh, to be racist, and has ha been incendiary in so many regards over the last few years, to the point at which the, he had major fashion designers walk away from him, Adidas walked away from him, Spotify, other uh, record entities walked away from him, but he still put this record out just recently, and it's resonating with people just for full disclosure, in the couple of months leading up to this album's release, he, he backtracked, he issued an apology in he, he, the Hebrew language on social media, which sounded more like a branding effort and a, a rehabilitation tour. You didn't have a sense that he was fully accepting that ev everything he had done. So, 
flash forward to Donna Summer, he wants to sample I Feel Love, her 1977 song. We love Donna Summer, by the way, here, because she's Boston's own, for people who don't know. And the estate said absolutely not because of this most recent history with Ye, Kanye West, and all of the things that he said. However, he just went ahead and put this on the album. It's now been pulled, uh, but the estate is now suing Kanye West for including this and saying it's the, the, you can't. It's not like the Ed Sheeran, the recent Ed Sheeran case, where you wonder was he just. Uh, was it a different manifestation of music he's heard over the years? No, clearly, Ye had asked for this permission, didn't get it, and went ahead and sampled it, it anyway. It was her voice, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Here, here is, uh, first of all, here's uh, Donna Summer in this 1977, I Feel Love. She was pretty great. I mean, yeah. she was pretty great. And here is the Kanye West yay version of So Good before uh, he was sued for unauthorized use. Here it is. Well, I mean, guilty. I mean, end of discussion. I mean, what do you need to hear the rest? I mean, it's ridiculous. And it wasn't just Donna Summer. He also did this to Ozzy Osbourne. He also asked for an Ozzy Osbourne song uh, that was Iron Man. The problem Man. was Ozzy Osbourne didn't know what room he was in no. when the song played, so he couldn't really... <laughs> That's not true, because Ozzy Osbourne also said, I'm not licensing my work to an anti-Semite. For that same, well, that's yeah. good for him, yeah. by yeah. the way. And he was still no, I'm glad did. she's doing it. I'm, I'm, I mean, you know, I don't have any use for Kanye West. I, I just always remember that... Uh, pres- former President Obama famously referred to him as a jackass, okay, which is uncharacteristically and famously referred to him as a jackass. I mean, I just think he is, and this is, he's been, he's not a novice. He's not an ingenue no. in the music business. He knew what he was doing when he did it, and he made the calculation that he was going to use that. And when Ozzy Osbourne went against him, he, t- he had previously credited uh, Ozzy Osbourne using a similar sample. It might have even been the same sample. He then, when Ozzy Osbourne objected to him using the sample from the song Iron Man, he sampled his own version of it for which Ozzy Osbourne had been credited. So he ended up spiting Ozzy Osbourne, knowing that Ozzy Osbourne didn't want him to use it. He ended up using yeah. it again. He knew exactly what he was how doing How do you here. know this? I mean, how it's do you story. know? It's in the story. They give us these things to read before we do the show, Jim. Oh, you, but you made it seem like it was just part of your, like, brain thing. And, uh, <laughs> That's... That's, that's your skill. That's my thing. Yeah, okay, that's fine. My, yeah, yeah. Now, uh, using your brain is your thing? Right. <laughs> you had Rakeeb Shaw. Oh, on, yeah, was, yes. yeah, when was he on the show? Uh, this Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. Okay, whatever. I don't even know why it matters. Here he is, uh, a little piece of Rakeeb Shaw with Jared on the Culture Show earlier this week. Here it is. I think uh, the problem with... Uh, Painting, especially nowadays, is that usually it takes 20 seconds. People people give 20 seconds in an art fair or any other situation. 20 seconds is what people give to a painting. But I feel that with these paintings, uh, the way I work, it just happens. So they, they happen to be layered. They happen to be... Uh, there, there seems to be a lot going on, but it wasn't really intentional because I, I don't think that I really keep the viewer in mind when I paint. This guy should have a talk show. I yeah. mean, he yeah. is really yeah. something. Tell us about his work. Well, his work is something, too. This is a must-see exhibition. Speaking of the Gardner Museum, it's at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum now through May 12th. And it's called Rakib Shah, Ballads of East and West. And he is somebody who grew up in Kashmir and what he considered this utopia. It was Eden, it was beautiful, lush landscapes and gardens and blue skies and the Himalayan mountains. But then there was insurrection, there was unrest, civil unrest, political unrest, and basically so much of it has been destroyed. So he left Kashmir, ultimately went to London, uh, where he was working for his family's merchant business, but walked into the National Gallery one day in London, and it changed his life when he began to look at painting. He hadn't even formally studied it at this point. So what he has done ever since walking into the National Gallery is paint these gorgeous, absolutely colorful, sumptuous, vast landscapes slash self-portraits of his vision of what Kashmir was like. However... And this is why he was talking about people race through galleries, spending 20 seconds looking at a Mm -hmm. painting before moving on to the next one. His demand slow looking, because if you start to take in his works, yes, 
They're pretty, they're beautiful, they're all those things. However, there's always a lingering, lurking menace. And it's because he's reconciling what has happened to this utopia. So you might be looking at a landscape, but you'll see snakes in the grass, or blood dripping, or some demonic creature. Or it's even more literal that you're in this very well-appointed room with these beautiful rugs and wood carvings, but out the window you see gray skies and bombs dropping and fire taking place. Did you read Sebastian Smee's uh, thing? What oh, is I have. Amazing. Well, not only is he one of the great, he won a Pulitzer, right, a couple yes. of years ago. He's yeah. brilliant. Listen to this. This is so captured. I had not seen Shaw's work, and then I went online and looked at it, and he captured this. He said, if you like art, you might have decided, for instance, you don't like conceptual art or surrealism. He goes on to say, you essentially think you know what you like, but listen to this. Your taste, carefully acquired, proudly maintained, should be rejecting it, meaning the Shaw stuff, but it can't. Yeah. You're seeing it from a slightly shifted angle. You can't deny it's amazing, and suddenly the glass wall you didn't even know was there lies shattered at your feet and that was my experience here when i first looked at it it's not my kind of thing exactly and you me look too. it is unbelievably powerful and beautiful so let me tell you a little bit more and one of the one of the little elements where i discovered this was again looking at this beautiful interior and i'm looking at this gorgeous wood carving that he's painted which by the way he does with a porcupine quill and enamel this wow. is how he paints uh, but i started to look at this wood carving and realize it's not a beautiful wood carving because the the wood carving uh, as he's painted it is actually grenades guns and ammo mm. so he's always reminding you that there's this evil out in the world that it's always kind of present but he also does all of this work from a sausage factory he <laughs> bought a sausage factory in london and turned it into his home and also created these beautiful gardens there so that he could start to kind of cre recreate what he had in cashmere so he has a he told me he had a he has a huge bonsai garden uh, and all the bonsais get sad when when he leaves, they perk up when he returns. <laughs> he can't have a talk show because he doesn't like to leave his sausage factory home very much. But he's just a fascinating but supremely talented man. So I, if people get a chance to read this, the review of this by Sebastian Smee, it's in the Washington Post, please do. There are, there are um, uh, reproduce, re reproductions of the art that don't exactly do it justice, but you really do get a sense of it. But the other thing he does is he puts himself in his yes. paintings in various incarnations. And I was the one thing I was dying to ask you was, why does he do it? And what is the impact of that on your earlier point that there's this underlying menace? Well, I think you start to put it all together. So in one way, he does describe these as self-portraits because he is rendering himself. And I'll just do one little asterisk asterisk to say there's another gallery within the Gardner Museum where you can see his process. You see the photographs that are taken of him so he can render himself and how he puts these together and how he layers them. Uh, but he really is inserting himself into this land, into this utopian ideal that he has, but also you can see wh where he exists in the painting, how close he is in proximity to, again, the, the, the apocalyptic, apocalyptic nature of the world as he saw it from his now gone homeland. So we're a little tight on time, but we do want to squeeze in because it's only here till March 10th at the ART. Becoming a Man, Jared Bowen. Yeah, Becoming a Man is a, a, a play that's on stage now at the American Repertory Theater, and it's by P. Carl, who is a long-time theater practitioner, theater artist here in the Boston area. And he, for about 50 years, lived as a girl and then as a queer woman. And then finally, at age 50, got the conviction, found the confidence in himself to make the transition that he needed to have to make himself more fully realized. He wrote about this in his very well-lauded book, Becoming a Man, but because he is a man of the theater, uh, he had many invitations to turn this into a play, which he has now done. It's being co-directed by Diane Paulus. And so in this about 90-minute play that's always followed by a discussion, as they call it, Act Two at the American Repertory Theater, we, see, we, we meet P. Carl at this point in his life where he has just basically been acknowledged a man for the first time in New York City in a hotel, has checked in, he's being appreciated for his, as he says in the play, his dudeness. And what I was struck by is just the candor of this piece. And so here he becomes a man for the first time at 50. And he tries out being a man in every regard. In, to some degree, that includes misogyny, because suddenly he is a white man, and he can get away with saying certain things in the world and actually be applauded by saying those things. Uh, we also see the conflict that he has with his wife. 
You know, the woman who married another woman who now has to reconcile the changing dynamics of the relationship. And it, her name in real life and the character is named Lynette. And as she says to him at one point, you obliterated our relationship. So we see how they navigate that. So there is a lot of candor. It's very raw, uh, but it really guides us through his process and gives us a deep understanding of what it means to be a transgender man and to make this choice and how has his doctor told him this changes everything in your life? Becoming a man, ART through March, March 10th. 10th. What are you doing this afternoon at 2 o'clock, Jared <laughs> Bowen? So we uh, just have a show on tape this week. Mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at a couple of interviews. One I did with Gis Jen, and the other is with uh, David Yazbek, who is the composer, the Tony winning co composer behind The Band's Visit. I saw The Band's Visit when I was here and in New York. It is spectacular. And talk about perfect for the times. Just yes. give 30 seconds on what the story is. So the band's visit is about a Egyptian police band who, because there are a few consonants off in their directions and asking for directions, <laughs> land in the middle of this, land in the middle of nowhere where nothing is happening in Israel. And you see how these two groups, Great. these two communities come together. Terrific. Two o'clock. A fabulous couple of interviews. Mr. Arts and Culture, okay, I, no, I could no. listen to them all what? day. What I can't stop say? myself. Normally we would have our weekend review. I can't tell you why we're not having the weekend review today, but I we, know why. we have fun things. I'm not allowed to say? No, we're not allowed to say, oh, but sorry. we have fun things sorry. coming. Well, we'll look forward to yeah. that. Thank you for that. Wait a second. Hanging. You can't say? No. Why not? I can't. I'm not allowed to. Can I say? No. Oh. <laughs> Can I say? No. Jamie says I can say. Can no, I say? No, you can't say. No. Can, I say? can you say? No. No. Can you say? I don't have any <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> so then maybe you shouldn't say. Let's leave it at that. Jared, it's good to see you. We'll be listening at 2 o'clock. Okay, Jared yes, Bowen. <laughs> we've, been we've been speaking with GBH News Executive Arts Editor Jared Bowen and host co-host of The Culture Show, which airs daily at 2 o'clock on GBH 89.7. After a quick break, news, new reporting out this week from GBH's Jennifer Moore grapples with the struggle of people in Massachusetts seeking information about their disabled relatives who are housed at the Fernald School in Waltham. Jennifer Moore joins us next with Harvard researcher and disabilities expert Alex Green. You're listening to Boston Public Radio 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio, Jim Browdy and Andrea Cabral, because Marjorie is not here. I'm finally realizing that. She'll be back on Monday. Hi, Andrea. We're streaming at youtube.com slash GBH News and facebook.com slash GBH News. We're next at the library on Tuesday. The Boston Police Commissioner Michael Cox will be with us. And starting Wednesday of next week, when we do come to the library, we'll be doing three days a week at the BPL. Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. In recent years, Massachusetts has fostered a reputation as the least transparent state in the country when it comes to public records and related things. We're not just talking about journalists trying to get a hold of a police log or the inner workings of Beacon Hill. It's also real everyday people trying and failing to access details about loved ones who for decades were housed in state institutions 
till they died. That's the focus of some fabulous new reporting this week by GBH Features Editor Jennifer Moore, standing beside us here. Also with her is Harvard lecturer Alex Green. Alex has been dealing with these access issues firsthand in his research. Also part of a commission looking, a state commission, looking into the history of state institutions here in Massachusetts. Alex, thanks for joining us. And Jennifer, congratulations on your great work. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you having very us. much. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Welcome to you both. Um, and I will say, uh, Jennifer, the piece is excellent. It, it, is it, excellent. it really is. I, I just learned so much. So tell me what drew you to it and how you developed it. I first stumbled upon one of the sources in the story at just a book event, a book signing event in Cambridge. Laura Zygman is one of the sources in the story. And in her, uh, in her talk at, in Cambridge, she mentioned that she had tried to do some research into her sister who had been disabled and who had lived at the Fernald School, this one of many institutions across the Commonwealth. And what caught me uh, by surprise was that she said she couldn't access the records. And so I just went up to her afterwards, after the, the lecture, and I said, I'd like to be in touch with you, you know, let me, let me reach out. So I went home and sent her an email. The more I learned about it, um, it, it just really struck me how much pain there is with not knowing, with not being able to grieve. And then there's also the, uh, the accountability and the, the democratic norms side of it. So that, that spoke to me. We have a little sound from Laura Zygmunt from your piece, as you say, trying to get records on her late sister, Cheryl. Here she is talking about that experience that you just described. They kept saying, well, we can't show you, we can't even pull photos from Fernald because there could be other people in those photos, you know, privacy for them. Laura Zygmunt, you know, can you take us back? We probably should have said, uh, some people may not know what Fernald was, Alex. Give us a sense of what it and similar places were like. Sure. Um, and what they were, what was the intention? Yeah, you know, these started out as progressive institutions and the, the Fernald School holds a particular place in that history as the very first one of these ever opened in the United States. Its history goes all the way back to 1848. And that progressive idea was, was the, the fir very first people championing the idea that folks with intellectual and developmental disabilities can learn and deserve a public education. Um, that then became a model that other people emulated and these institutions popped up all over the, the state and then all over the country. And under Walter Fernald, um, who the school was later named for, um, uh, it really became a, a leading place in the world for studying special education and all of these sorts of things. But it, it has a very dark side, which is these became warehouses for people ultimately. And um, I think we think of that as being in the very, very, very far past, but in actuality, you know, these were at their sort of peak overcrowding and worst of conditions in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And so um, it means that there's a lot of people still alive or v with very recently deceased relatives um, uh, who are still looking for answers and still trying to grapple with this story. Um, and this is a whole sort of hidden story that's lost because often we confuse these with being asylums, which were places, state hospitals, were mm -hmm. places for people with mental illness. But these were really uniquely different. You know, Jen Moore, this, uh, we should be very clear. Laura Zygman is not aberrational uh, based on your reporting. Step back and give us like a fuller picture if you can. Right. And so... Laura is, as you said, one example of people trying to get records on direct next of kin, right, direct siblings. Um, she tried to go to the state archives and was told that, um, you know, she can't access the specific file of her own sister, even though her sister has been deceased for many, many decades. Um, and so, you know, she was then led on a very confusing path to different state agencies and told that she would probably have to get a lawyer just to get these records on her sister. And so uh, this is a really widespread problem because of how many people stayed in these institutions over the decades, right? Over the generations. And uh, as Alex said, many of them are still living and many of their relatives are now starting to wonder what happened. Well, along with um, uh, Laura Zygmunt's story sort of typifying the struggle that people have to actually gain information about their relatives, you have other stories in the piece about the experiences of the people that live there, just in their day-to-day -day living, that fairly well typify 
um, what that existence was like in these schools. Can you talk a little bit uh, about, and I'm sure Alex, you, have, you know of these stories as well. If you both want to, starting with Laura, talk about what was this like uh, for, for these kids, really, that were placed there. That's a great question, Andrea, and really, it kind of underscores the fact that we really don't know as much as we could, right? We don't know a whole lot about it, thus the, and that's the for the point. record, right? Uh, right, right. <laughs> um, but I will also say that there were some children there who likely had good experiences. In fact, um, Laura Zygmunt has said that there were therapies that her sister was likely able to um, attain, have access to there that she would not have in other places. Um, but the thing is, again, we just don't know, and it's on a case-by-case -case basis. And, and Alex, I'm sure, would be able to talk to, talk to the more day-to-day -day routine. Yeah, well, I, th I think you're absolutely right. We, we need a fuller understanding of these things. Right now, we're trapped in a space where, and you often hear people say this, I, I hold no judgment again the, against them because we don't know enough of the history yet to get past it, but you'll hear people say, well, and even people were placed in there who were not disabled. And, and my thought is always, that kind of splits us between like the notion that some people deserved to be, to be treated very badly and some people don't. Right. And I think that's a really false equivalency. We know that... Um, some people had an okay time there, and especially in a reform era after the federal government got involved, things got much, very improved over the 80s and 90s until these places closed down. But um, by and large, I think the biggest thing we're seeing with this records issue is we are still thinking of these folks primarily as having been patients, um, and I think that we need to start thinking of them as having been victims. Um, their days were by and large, some of the most horrifying human rights things I have ever heard in my career. That's the voice of Alex Green, Harvard lecturer. Jen Moore is our colleague at GBH, a features editor, who's done this wonderful story. Before we talk about why it's so difficult to get the records and what can be done, if anything, you're such a, you are such a fabulous storyteller. Not only the Laura Zygmunt situation, the people you chose to speak to are so powerful. David Scott is one of them. And David Scott was somebody whose brother was taken away from his parents when he was an infant. And here is David talking about seeing an interview, his brother's name was John, seeing an interview with one of John's former teachers at the Fernald. Here it is. For some reason, my brother was the first person she mentioned in her class. And she had said that, um, Without a doubt, he was abused. Almost every day when he came to class, she would have to send him back out because his colostomy bag was never changed. Unbelievably. We're going to meet David in a second. Tell us a little bit more about David and John. Yeah, David lives in Brockton. Uh, he is re a retired trash collector, and he is now the sole caregiver for his son, uh, Michael. I was able to go to their home in Brockton mm. and do this interview, um, and it was very... Um, it was very emotional for David, obviously, to recall his, his brother, John. John was born with a severe case of spina, uh, spina bifida mm -hmm. and um, went to the Fernald School as a newborn. Kat, we are really honored by David, but can you join us at the mic for a second? David Scott, can we uh, welcome David Scott, please, to the show, if you would? Thank you. Thank you. David, I, I have to say, only from what I know of you from Jen's reporting, I can't tell you how much I admire you, and I'm guessing how much your brother John would love you for what you've done. It's 51 years. What, what impact does what you don't know have on your everyday life, and why are you still pursuing the truth about the situation with your brother? Well, s some days are better than others. It, it's always with me, and... I was explaining to Laura and Alex the other day, after, you know, um, I'm sorry, not Laura, I'm sorry, Jennifer, Jen, yeah. after Jen had done the interview with me, to listen to the interview and to read it and to know that it, it just, it hit me harder. So some days are, are better than others, and having my son born that way um, obviously empowered me to want to do more about it, and he's like the brother I never met, and we could barely visit him because we didn't have a car. And we, you know, were in Boston, and he was in Waltham, and it was, it was hard. So I was seven years old when he passed away. Um, I have very vague memories of him, and um, I just want to know more about him. And every time I try to gain access to his records, which were thrown everywhere all over the school when they closed the school, they were more, they were more accessible to the vandals than they were to me, his next of kin. And um, I've called Galvin's office. Secretary and, of State, yeah. 
No, I called 72 hours ago and nobody's called me back yet. Why do you think, why does the truth about your brother matter so much to you a half century after the fact, David? Because I think that his, you know, like his teacher had said, his colostomy bag, I think because of all the other cases of true abuse that were there, real abuse, I think my brother, my brother was very, very vulnerable because he was in a wheelchair. His legs were atrophied. He passed away when he's, he was 18, and on his um, death certificate, it lists edema, heart failure, you know, just things that coincide with uh, mm. abuse. And it's just, if my, I just, I just want his voice to be heard for my mother and father, as well as him, and my son, Michael. David, we're honored to have you and Michael here today. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, thank you for your admiration. Thank you. He's in, he, he's entitled to that, and so the the story hit me as a person who worked in government. I headed you know agencies, and I never understood the stiff arming because nothing you do is going to keep it buried for long. And I know most people live in increments of well, it's only as long as I'm here, as long as I don't have to I don't have to deal with it while I'm here. But this is particularly egregious. And in you know in your piece, there are pictures of the documents just strewn all over the place. Apparently this building was sold to the city of Waltham in 2014, but, but just a colossal screw up by the, the state agencies who were supposed to secure all of those records. They're not even in a position to turn over a lot of these records, but they should be turning over the ones that they do have some sort of dominion over or retain, have retained dominion over. So here's the thing that I found really interesting in, um, in this story. You know, it intersects, obviously, with a lot of areas. It intersects with the idea of family, uh, with the idea of dignity of marginalized communities, right? But also, it, it, it has this core question of why are these public records, which, again, belong to all of us, the public, Of your right? family members. <laughs> right, of your own family members, not allowed to, uh, why can't the, pub can't the family members see them? And so, you know, I I'm glad you mentioned, Andrea, having been a public official, because when you go in and read the law, the statutes in Massachusetts, right, there is a very detailed list of what constitutes public records. It's broad. I'm here to congratulate all of you. You all have a lot of public records. So um, <laughs> the thing is, the exemption, the list of exemptions is about nine times right. longer it's more than exception the definition. Than well, can we hear, hear, you talked to Secretary Galvin about this. Here's a little bit of what he had to say about why he can't release these records, even though he says he'd like to. Here's Bill Galvin. There are some aspects of the law that you can't deny. There, there are some aspects of the, that are so rigid that you need the permission of the change or change in the statute. Uh, the statute's pretty, pretty firm. And you interviewed somebody who said, well, actually, he could release these records. You yeah, break absolutely. the tie there, Alex. Why can't David and people like David see the records of their family members? I, I just want to briefly add a, a layer of depth Please. to this that, that, that hasn't come through yet. Uh, D David's brother, John, is also one of 298 people buried under a nameless grave in the city of Waltham oh under God. just a letter and a number. Um, this is the indignity that we're dealing with. And to get that list, I had to be given that by someone in the community who possessed it because the state archives will not even turn over the list of names of the people buried there, which normally would be considered what's called a vital record. The more I learn about this, and the more that I see the laws and, and hear from lawyers and advocates, the more that I understand this, um, the more I'm just, uh, frankly, outraged and, and just gravely disappointed in the Secretary's interpretation of this, which is completely out of step with what the law says. The, he, his job is to balance the public interest with the need for secrecy or privacy. And in those cases, we're seeing it in Washington State, the Attorney General there overruled their prohibition on giving out records and said, you have got to start opening this up. Um, the so meaning of, honoring privacy at the same time meeting the needs of a family member. That's correct. And, and um, I, I just have been thinking the last few days since Jennifer's piece came out, the amount of time that Secretary Galvin allocated to giving that interview, in that time he could have settled this issue. In that time the governor could settle this issue That's or the attorney true. general. There is change that is so cut and dried on this issue. So David Scott and Laura Zegman and many others can't get critical information to them that should be public uh, about someone they loved. You're on a task force that the state 
uh, put together to look at the state's institution. I'm guessing, I know what the answer is. How much access do you have to these records? So I, I should say, and I, I don't represent the views of the whole commission, I did write the legislation to, to oh, create did? it as well. And okay. um, because I felt that there was a need for just this issue. And, and Senator Mike Barrett was the champion who kind of pushed this through, rightly understanding having worked at the Fernald School as a, as a college student. Um, we knew that records were going to be a serious issue. At the moment, from what I understand from the kind of um, uh, the group that, that the commission has hired to do the research, um, they are also running into records issues. And um, I would imagine that those vary by agency. The, the number of agencies that hold these records all have different rules. Um, so, so we're not just talking about the Secretary of State's office, but also the Executive Office of Health and Ser Human mm -hmm. Services, and they're split up between different agencies. So it, it's a mess. It's a mess. So I think we need to make the distinction between um, uh, records that a family should be able to access on behalf of their loved ones and public records that uh, news outlets and others routinely ask for and when they don't get them after repeatedly asking under the Freedom of Information Act they tend to sort of file lawsuits so, so, and then they often get action. So as I'm reading this, what I'm thinking immediately is, okay, so what can, what can individual people do? Because it's, it's, it's sad to say how easy it is to stiff arm somebody like David Scott who's just one person looking for their relatives' records and sorry, we can't do it, and you're up against the state, what do you do? So I thought, have people, and, and forgive me if people have already thought about this, um, have people thought about going to the probate court as a group of plaintiffs and saying, make us, it, 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 legally it's a nunc pro tunking, right? Backdate us to make us the guardians of the estates of our relatives where we would then be entitled as executors to get this stuff. Or do you file a class action? Um, uh, maybe under a probate rubric of all of these people. Like, if, uh, is that, can, can that kind of stuff be well, done? If you want to lead us, you're, you're hired. <laughs> I, um, I think she is. I, uh, you're absolutely right. So that is actually the only avenue open right now. You can go to a probate court. Uh, the fees are somewhere between $600 and $1,000 oh without God. a lawyer. You have to be able to know how to navigate this, provide an entire list of names of all the deceased and living relatives. The list goes on and on and on. David and I are working on this right now with a, a pro bono lawyer um, to try it out and see if it works. Um, because finally DDS, the Department of Developmental Services, clarified the rules on this. But uh, the other things that people can do, I, th I think, look, the secretary, if he doesn't budge on this, is going to face a lawsuit, I think, sooner than later. But there are also, there's legislation in the state house that would open up records after 75 years, like other states do. Right now, I want to be very clear, they're using this as a blanket protection. If you had a relative who was in a hospital during the Revolutionary War, and they have a record on that at the State Archives, you cannot access that. They can't even tell you that they have it unless you go to that probate court and get, the, get approval that's first. Outrageous. By the way, a, a good for the legislators who are proposing 75 years, that's not gonna do anything good if it becomes law for David. You know, can we put this in a larger context? I, I am like steaming, and not only steaming because of the stories you've told and David's story and Laura's story, this is part and parcel of who we are in Massachusetts. We've discussed ad nauseum on the show. Marjorie and I, Marjorie uh, and Andrea, Andrea and I, we are the single least transparent state in the United States. Let me put it another way. There's one state in America where every branch of government claims exemption from public records laws. What state is that, uh, Jen Moore? Massachusetts. So, uh, I mean, so what's, I mean, what's your analysis in liberal Massachusetts of what the hell is going on? You know, I think it gets back to a really a fundamental understanding of why public records are critical to democracy, right? Um, and public records are kind of hard to get people excited about. I mean, I'm excited about them, but I'm a I'm public records nerd, right? Um, and many times we'll, when I will suggest a story idea about, oh, transparency, it's just kind of like crickets chirping. Um, <laughs> But it's important because it's a staple of self-rule, right? The idea being you cannot know what your institutions are doing in your name unless you have access to those records. And so it affects every single one of us. And David and Laura are just um, very human, very um, special examples of that. But it affects every single one of us. But see, that's, to me, that's the most important point. I, I, I say the same things you just said about the effect it has on everybody, and everybody goes to sleep and says, OK, fine, you journalists, you researchers, you whatever. These are living human beings. They're not 
some sort of elite professional, and with all due respect to you, a guy who's doing research on this stuff, surely for the public good, these are real people who, because of our a culture of secrecy and hiding our sins in this society. And by the way, it serves a purpose, obviously. It, the less you tell the public, the less the public knows about what you did. You're about to uh, interject. Feel but free. I, I think you can see that, that there, at the end of the day that the reason this keeps happening and persisting is because there is no accountability for it. And those photos in the Boston Globe of the exactly Fernald right. School with the city exactly. of Waltham for 10 years letting thousands of vandals break into this school, this former institution, and rifle through these records to get a, a note from family members like David or Laura, who I, I deal with every day, day in and out, saying, are those my loved one's records in that trash can? Waltham does that because they know there are no consequences to that, that no one's going to do anything. The state government does that because they know there is no consequence. And I think that's really, really unfortunate for our democracy and for our society and for our collective conscience. Well, the other, one of the other suggestions is, I don't know if there, there should be a, dis, uh, a law against destroying public records. I don't know, I don't even know, shame on me, I don't even know if Massachusetts has it. If they don't, they should have one. But I make this argument all the time. Until you start saying to people, telling the public what they're paying out in settlements and judgments, mm -hmm. and these are just on the FOIA requests, these are just on media requests, the, the, the thousands and tens of thousands of dollars that municipalities and the state pay out for failing to comply with the Freedom of Information Act, that's basically the state agencies saying to taxpayers, we have, we're, on the one hand, we're declining to make these records public. On the other hand, when we get called on the carpet for it, when you file a lawsuit, you're going to pay for that. That's taxpayer money. So please make that a component of every argument you make. All of the settlements and judgments collectively for the last 10 years that they've had to pay out for whatever records have been withheld, that's the real cost of doing business. So it's much cheaper to just give us the records and, and, and let the chips fall where they may. And, and let me tell you, you provided sunshine. Hopefully it is the disinfected Gen more. Congratulations to you. Alex Green, great to Thank meet you. Thank you both And so most much. importantly, David Scott and Michael, we really Thank appreciate you. what you're doing and joining us today. Thanks to all four of you. It was Thanks great. So Thank much you. for having us. We've been speaking with GBH News Features Editor Jennifer Moore, as well as Harvard Lecturer Alex Green. Jennifer's reporting on public records access in Massachusetts is now available at gbhnews.org. After a quick break, it's, a Boston, it's Boston, Go Boston Globe business columnist Shirley Leung, easy for me to say, here to talk about a re-envisioned downtown for Boston and all that the city could and should do with all of those empty office spaces. Shirley's next. You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy and Andrew Cabral. Marjorie is out. She'll be back on Monday. We're live at the library. Stream at youtube.com slash gbh news and facebook.com slash gbh news. I should have said, if you want to listen to or read Jennifer Moore's fabulous piece, go to gbhnews.org, gbhnews.org, and you can uh, read it and listen to it uh, yourself. Uh, Starting next week, next week, next week, we're here on Wednesday for the first time, which means we'll be here three days a week, every week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're joined now by Boston Globe business columnist Shirley Young. Shirley also hosts the podcast Say More with Shirley Young. New episodes drop every Thursday, and she joins us weekly. Hey, Shirley, how are you? Hello, Shirley. Hi, Jim. Nice to Hi, see Andrea. you. 
I am so glad we're ending Friday on this note because this is just like a tornado of good <laughs> ideas about what to do about something we all, you know, who has not walked around downtown or walked past City Hall and gone, you know, we really are far too old a city to have not done something better with all of this. So talk about what Boston can learn from other cities um, about how to revitalize downtown, especially in a post-pandemic right. era. So this was, uh, I, I wrote, uh, I, was, I wrote as part of a, a special section put out by the Globe Ideas section. The full section's out Sunday in print. There's like 10 pieces. Oh, it's fabulous. terrific. I didn't um, know that. I'm yeah, psyched. Brian Bergstein, the Globe I Ideas editor, has been working on this for months. And, uh, and so I contributed one story to this amazing package um, about what we can learn from other cities. And um, that was a fun assignment for me because I love to see what other cities are doing that we can borrow. And one of the things is from your hometown, Philly. Philadelphia. What are we doing? Well, Philadelphia has had a 40-year public mural program, public art mur public mural program. It's amazing. I think they commission up to, I don't know if it's like a thousand pieces, like, you know, many pieces of public art murals every year. Um, there's so much... Um, you know, mural, so many murals in Philly that they actually do tours, organized tours that you wow. pay for. They're and fabulous. So, it's really, they're really fabulous. Now, Boston, we do have a mural arts program. It's getting there. It's, but it's not like Philadelphia where it becomes a, de a draw. This is the reason why you come downtown, you drive around the city, uh, you spend some time here. So I'm hoping, uh, that was one of the ideas. And then the other idea that I, uh, that, people brought up to me was this idea of social districts and um, or social zones and this is the idea of open container you know alcohol where you're imagine like right now we have beer gardens right so you can drink you know during the spring you know whether it's at, on the esplanade or the greenway in a designated area right but imagine if you're on the greenway and you can start at the north end walk all the way to south station with a you know, with glass of wine and you're strolling, maybe you're looking at more murals, you know, on the Greenway. Or you could do this in Downtown Crossing, too. How about, you know, by the way, one of my favorite people, that'd be me, when arguing with Mayor Walsh <laughs> and Commissioner <laughs> Evans that they should close Newbury Street. Right. Which, by the way, I am responsible for, I would argue. <laughs> I said to them exactly what you yes. said. Make it more fun. It's right. great you're closing it. Let people... Stroll drink and Norbury they can't Street. leave right. Newbury Street if right. you're worried about having them. So why aren't we, I mean, Michelle Wu is a pretty creative soul. She is. Is she thinking of this stuff? Well, this is the kind of stuff that, of course, anything with alcohol, you have to go to Beacon Hill to get their blessing. They would need to approve? I, I believe so. I, 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 mean, I actually don't know. I assume so. I assume our liquor licenses are so locked down that you would probably need some kind of special legislation. But other cities have done this, whether it's Arizona. Um, for example, Arizona, they started with the cities in Arizona, they started with a pilot program that started with outdoor malls. And then it became, I mean, a lot of these programs actually started during the pandemic. Um, you know, other, other downtowns across the country are, are trying to figure out now that the office workers, you know, have emptied out downtown, how do we draw people back? And so there have been pilots, there have been exper experiments, and so they have forged ahead. Now, I have to say, Boston, we do a lot. We do, we've done a lot of... We have inflatable program. clown heads, right, we have inflatable. which I have to say, have you seen them yet? I've only seen pictures of oh, them. They are have spectacular. To go. <laughs> you must see no, the clown heads. You drive down Washington must see the clown heads. Street at the corner of Lafayette and Washington, you look up between a couple of theaters yep. and you see these huge inflatable and the critic, the art you critic, You don't think clowns the hell are scary he, then? Well, <laughs> not, in, not, not these. these. Not I, these. Were your kids, your kids Sam? <laughs> I, I was supposed to, I've been sick, so I haven't been, I wanted oh, to take them So going. we don't know if they're scared yet. Well, I, well, I told them out then. They were a little freaked out, but I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm still going to take, but I'm going to take okay. them. I'm going to, no, I don't care. I'm going to take them because I think they'll love them. I'll think they'll, they will get kick, a kick out of seeing these heads wedged in the alleys. Well, um, you know, all so we were talking this morning. I don't know if this is part of the series that's appearing Sunday, which uh, which is fabulous. I'm yeah, glad it's, it's online doing this. and it'll oh, it be, is. Uh, it's online now. How about yep. this idea for for the space, the uh, uh, vacant office space that can't be converted for whatever reasons to housing, which obviously should be everybody's first goal. Some sort of manufacturing yes. kind of thing. What's that about? That yeah, so that was a piece by Rachel Slade, a Boston-based journalist, and she actually just wrote a whole book about manufacturing. Is that part of this deal too? Um, well, she wrote about um, you know bringing 
manufacturing back to America. Okay. And her idea for downtown Boston is um, not all the empty offices can be converted mm-hmm. to housing, but a lot of them can be convert, converted into manufacturing. Not, not your, you know, the, the gi- ginormous factories of mm-hmm. yesteryear. Maybe 5,000 square feet, uh, more advanced manufacturing, more clean tech, kind of high tech manufacturing can come to downtown Boston. And she said that the floor plans, it's just easier to convert office, these office buildings into kind of micro manufacturing factories, little factories. And that wouldn't need the state legislators approval. It's it, just it a probably, zoning I, issue. I think it's a zoning okay, issue, fine. exactly. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but they have infrastructure. There are wires in the exactly. ceilings. The floor plates are huge. Exactly. You can put giant pieces of equipment or whatever exactly exactly so it makes sense and one of the things for for me working on this as being part of the series it made me realize you know i you know i write about um you know i'm I'm a long-time business columnist and I'm, I'm, i'm always thinking about downtown and for the first time i was like you know what we've been so focused on on office workers bringing office workers back you know, four to five days a week, as if that's the answer. Never happening. But but we probably will never get there. Yeah. So right. we have to think of what are the alternatives. Right. That's exactly. What are the right. other reasons why people should come back downtown? And it could be. And I've I've done this in my own. You know, when I'm a situation when I'm working from home, right during the day, um, during you know, where, let's say it's on a Monday or Tuesday, um, I'm working from home. I will do that reverse commute. I will go into downtown in the evening for dinner or a drink. And so that's, that's, you have to draw people back downtown, not for work. You know, I didn't read this, but you were raving about it this morning. There's another piece of the Globe thing, yeah. was soliciting reader thoughts. Yeah, about, yeah. Well, give us some of those, if you yeah. would. Yeah, okay. I mean, what was your favorite? Um, well, I had to, I had nostalgic um, uh, warm feelings because Larry DeCara, oh, yes. who's 74, took the time to kind of, you know, but he's right. He said, get universities to house their students downtown. They could convert lower floors and older office buildings, which are often the first to become vacant, into dorms. I think the students would enjoy living downtown. It would free up housing in many neighborhoods for families. That's somebody who's thinking critically about, you have a popu- you have two sets of population that need to be housed, families and students. Everybody hates where every place the students <laughs> live. Bring them downtown and let the families have the neighborhoods. Right. But there were, there were other really, really good ones. In fact, it's your segment. <laughs> Catherine, I love the first one. Catherine oh, Neve, yes, I loved hers. Downtown. I thought she what she said. The green. Yeah. No, go ahead. Talking about covering every inch of downtown, roofs, vertical parks with plants. You know, I people love that. are drawn to green. Yep. Um, I love that, and uh, I love the last item because um, the kids, the school kids, the school kids, and um, they talked about uh, bringing raising canes. So my kids are 11, 13. Raising canes is fried chicken fingers. I never fingers. heard of it. I never. They're, my kids are obsessed with raising canes. Do you want to hear a clip when raising cane opened its first store in the Greater Boston area in 2011, courtesy of Nicole, our colleague? Of course you do. Here it is. What do you guys want? Chicken fingers. What are you going to get? How do you feel about being the first customer raising canes? It feels amazing. Uh, <laughs> uh, like two hours. Two hours. Okay. <laughs> but my kids love raising canes. I think it's like a TikTok thing or something. But they love it. Oh, but that's why what? I don't know anything. Guess about what? Raising canes is actually coming to downtown. Grassley. Really? Excuse they me. You see that Nicole spot. right over there, right Nicole here. Garcia? What'd you have for lunch today, Nicole? Raising canes. Just Thank down you. The street here. Exactly. Well, there They're you are. Across the street from here. So, okay. But um. But yeah. So I I, I love I love that kids. But people kids, have good ideas. They, they will come if you if you do the stuff that they say. You, you build can, it. Yeah. They also By the way, have, we're going at the end of the show. <laughs> going to take your suggestions to add to this about what would lure you to downtown if you're not coming now. You said they also have what? Go ahead. Oh, wait, I was going to say cat cafe. The kids cat cat, cat cafe. Of course. I, I would. I, they should. The street should be lined with cat yeah, cafes. Cat cafes. As far as I'm and then a night. Market. I like that idea. A night market. Right. We, we, we could use a night market. I tell you, my younger daughter, I think I told her, went to South Korea a couple of years ago mm-hmm. and she went to a raccoon uh, uh, a bar where literally, just like cats roam and these kinds really? of things, raccoons <coughs> roam. They get in your lap, they allegedly go in your wow. pockets to try adorable. to take your we wallet. Might state, state we might need state We might need state approval for that. Maybe I'm <laughs> sorry, probably. That they would probably give state approval to. You know, on a related thing, and, and this is downtown ish, needless to say. Is Quincy Market. Yes. It has changed uh, hands. And while we don't want to discourage anybody who's trying to run a business, I think the conventional wisdom is it ain't what it used to be. Yep. 
So what, what, are the, what are the plans and what are the prospects? I, this was Joan Vinaki wrote Joan, about, right, yeah, Joan right, Vinaki yep. wrote about this and how she loves, you know, she, she remembers the Quincy market of, of the 70s and 80s. And so do I. Loved, yeah, and so do I when it. I moved here in the 80s. Right, it was great. It. And then she realized, wait a minute, I shouldn't fall in love with that. We need a more modern, you know, Quincy market, Faneuil Hall. Um, it's, it's right now, it's, it's become a, a tourist trap. Really. But by the way, it was modern and contemporary temporary in the 80s, but then it, it just grew old it, exactly. because they didn't change enough with the times. Right. I mean, actually, it was, I think, um, a, a really, um, it was incredibly innovative. I mean, it was, became the model a model for outdoor retail and restaurants. And I think, I'm not country. 100% sure, wasn't after Fenway, wasn't Quincy Market in the old days the number one tourist attraction? In Boston, it would I make thought sense. so. I don't it was know. right. It I was think right it's up still there. very popular. It is. It's just that it's we we know it's old and dated, and it's it's had some land. You know, it's now changed. Uh, you know, they've just got a new landlord there, and so and and June talks about how. Um, you know, every it's been the responsibility of every mayor, really, to because I think the lease is held, or the the technically the city hall is mm -hmm. the landlord, and they have to find. Um, I mean, they own the building, and then they have to mm -hmm. find someone to 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 lease and operate um, Quincy Market, and so it's been the responsibility of every mayor to provide a vision, and so now it's her turn, and I know she's tr she is trying because they just booted out the the last um, you know landlord, and now someone else. Is new is coming in, but I, I think they want to make it a, a destination, not just for tourists, but also for um, for the locals. I mean, I love Durkin Park there. I miss Durkin. It's Park. only been gone about 80 years. You <laughs> no, know no, that? no, it's only I'm gone. I'm joking. Like, How long has it been gone? I think 2019, 2020. How many of you are at Durkin Park? Have ever been at Durkin Park? <laughs> not enough. Well, actually, maybe a third it's or a half. A lot of people. The yeah, beauty of Durkin great. Park is you go to be treated like crap by the servers. It was that's, that was essentially. That's what she says. And, and lure, enjoy some it? bland New England food. <laughs> and really. Yeah. Cheap lobster, right? right? Well, it yeah. was. It was fairly affordable. But think of the, if you had that plus the revitalization of downtown, what a, what a hub that would be. It would be. It would be. Well, you know, can I, I was going to say this during when we have our discussion with the listeners, but let me just say one of the other things Mayor Wu has talked about that I should have looked up this morning. Maybe either of you know what the status is. She was. The, remember when Copley was closed at the end of COVID, the uh, 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 the square here yeah. down the street. It's so Europe. And when you say this, is oh, it's so European. It's so European. These downtown notions where mm. people get used to traffic having to be diverted. You can bring families. Your kids can bicycle around. They don't have to worry because they're not in the street kind of thing. You have food, hopefully drinks, and yeah. if the legislature buys in, that kind of thing. Making it more gatherable, which I know is not a word in downtown, is really incredibly appealing to me. If either of you have been in any of these European plazas, right in the middle of major yeah. European cities, well, what is it? What is it? Uh, Venice. It's like the Virtually Saint Mark's, everywhere. Saint Mark's, Saint Mark's Square or whatever. Yeah. Apparent, I mean, all these places have these great things, and I think that's the kind of thing that she's been talking about. We just don't know if it's going to happen. So, can we talk about something near and dear to my heart? Yes. More chargers for electric vehicles. <laughs> yes. In, well, I mean, it's a big thing. It it's is. A, it's listen, listen. I, I I have a heat pump. I don't use my gas stove. I didn't stove. know you had a heat pump. I have it absolutely. I, well, I've been doing. Now that I've been co-hosting the show, we talked to Bill McKibben. Yeah. There's no way I can leave the show and not go and do stuff. <laughs> I put a new roof on my house so I can oh, have wow. solar panels. I'm hoping to do that this either. year. And my next car will be an electric car. So you're going to worry about this. Th but I, So I love this. Okay. I love yeah. this idea. But Jim Jim has been preaching this to me for the longest time. Well, because you know, McKibben said to us yesterday, which yeah. I thought was really important, is when you buy an EV, you say to yourself, well, I can't take a 400-mile drive right. without stopping. And as he said, most of us don't take 400-mile drives right. except once or twice a year. However, there is this charger anxiety that people have so what is will what's the city doing it there will be is it 250 yeah with 250 new um ev chargers will be uh you know rolled out i think it's a, a 10-year contract so it it seems i mean i was i, I was interested in some of the stats and the stories at 7,000 registered evs i was in surprised Boston. there's so few actually yeah. but um, yeah and um but it doesn't seem like there are that many chargers though no um, like you, uh, there's one at the whole foods in jamaica plain like you, you have to kind of you have to really look to find them. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're but there's a problem. For those who don't have an EV, the problem, I don't want to cause the anxiety to build. It, many of the, if you have a Tesla, you are lucky enough, despite it being owned by uh, Elon Musk, 
is you have the fast charger, where in 30 or 40 minutes, right. you charge 300 miles. The, the medium, the level two chargers, which are the kinds that are at the Whole Foods or the stop and shops, are like 20 miles an hour. So even if it's in a parking lot of a supermarket, the good news is you can do something. You go shop, you shop for an hour right. at most, you added 20 miles to your capacity. Oh, that's it? That's it. Maybe 23, 24. So you need a lot more, and yeah. you need them within, I don't know, an eighth of a mile. I'm making up a number. Yeah. An eighth of a mile of your house. And I, th I think, despite the objective reality that Bill McGibbon told us about, if people thought they were accessible and affordable, and I think they are really affordable compared to gas, there'd be many more people who are buying these damn cars. What's your, been your experience since you've, you've owned your Tesla? Uh, with my experience with what? With charging. I send my younger daughter out and she charges the car. No. Uh, what, now, sadly, that's true, by the way. She's very, it's one of the few things she does for me. No, we're, uh, the Lennox has a charger and they're kind enough to let us charge the cars there. Right. And so we're, we're, we're lucky that we're here. They treat, by the way, the Lennox is one of the great, not only great hotel, incredibly generous and a wonderful host for us downtown. But it's hard. For example, if I want to get a Tesla, I live in Inman Square in Cambridge. Yeah. If, I want, if I don't have a charge here that's adequate, like if I, I am going 100 miles. And you have to charge miles, once a day? I, no, 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 okay. no, no. I, 300 miles for oh, average driving gets you like practically a week in the I city. Mm -hmm. I have to drive into Somerville, like four miles from my house, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's 15 minute drive each way to sit there at the stop and shop. Now, luckily it's a Tesla supercharger. So as long as you're shopping inside, it fills up kind yeah. of thing. You don't have an EV. Do you? I don't. It, Why it, don't you? Because my husband has this EV charger anxiety. Well, that's just exactly and, what I'm um, talking about. And, I, and, and the more I read about it, because I was thinking, what's nice about gas is that you go to a gas station, it's predictable, it's convenient, you know you drive up, you gas up, you're, you're in and out in like less than a few, less than five minutes. But... I, I think I would develop EV charger if I didn't know and, no, where and also, I would find it. You can have it, they, they, like Honda has a, an yeah. EV model where you can, it has a home charger kit. Right, I would charge it you can home. actually, which, yeah. which it's, it is pricey, but you're, you'd never have to worry I think that's about why that. I would definitely charge it home. I am so yeah. excited to get an EV. The only reason I haven't gotten one yet is because this car is still going good, and it's, it's old, but it's still going good. But yeah, I mean, I think, I, but Bill's right, the more of these that are available, yeah. What I wanted to ask you about was the immediate pushback that you get in places like the city council. You start to hear from neighbors. Right. People go, what's the impact on traffic? Right. What's the impact on, you know... Parking. Parking. And parking is always going to be a problem. Yeah. Nothing about Boston is ever going to change. But what's that got to do with an EV? I mean, a car is a car when it comes to parking, right? It's with, where you put the, if you put the charging stations oh, curbside, sorry, yeah. people sorry. are going to be oh, pulling up and charging their cars, and you know some people will try to park there. They'll park block it. them. Right, exactly. But to Bill McKibben's point... If there's, an, if there's a disaster and the entire city floods, you're not going to have to worry about, you know, if we're all underwater, you don't have to worry about where you park. So <laughs> right. what's your take That's on right. the pushback to it and the balance the mayor's going to have to well, achieve? Well, I, mean, I mean, she's getting pushed back on a lot of issues. So this is just, this will be just one more to her list. Oh, but I, but we, do have to have, we do have to have the EV chargers if you want more um, EVs in the city. Right. I mean, there's no way around it. it Let me be clear. Your kids are not opposed to EVs. They are, they? are not opposed okay. to EVs Even at the moment. Even though they voted no on the on, Milton, on Milton thing. Yeah, of course, they, they couldn't vote. vote. Right. Too young. Okay, so what's the podcast deal this week? Actually, we have some sound from it. Do you want to play some, some sound? Here is a clip from your latest Say More where the hosts of the Pantsuit Politics. Politics podcast, where you'll tell us what that is in a minute. Yeah. They're talking about the difficulty of covering Trump's legal travails. Here it is. Like, I just think that it's really difficult because it is so deeply weird. It's just deeply weird. weird. The state of the Republican Party is weird. And I think the consistent issue across those three very different elections, including the one we're in, is that it's, it's hard in a two-party system when one party is broken. Don't they work in a red state? They do. So that was Sarah Stort Holland. And uh, uh, you didn't hear her, but the other, her, her other co-host is Beth Silvers. Mm -hmm. They're terrific. I hope you guys have them on. They, are, they oh, live great. in Kentucky, two working moms. Uh, Sarah is, uh, you know, was raised a conservative, maybe even evangelical, mm -hmm. and now is liberal. Beth Silvers is a recovering Republican. Uh, I think after Trump, she Recovery. went independent. Um, she was telling 
telling us on the podcast that she plans to, um, you know, pull a, you know, even though she's independent, she's going to pull a Republican ballot so, just so she can vote for Nikki Haley. And um, but they're they're known as America's political therapists, mm. and uh, they have this terrific podcast called Pantsuit Politics. And we, uh, you know, I, I wanted to talk about politics, but not you know, the horse race. And their specialty is how do we talk about politics? You know, they talk about grace-filled conversations. How do we talk to each other? We are right. so divided. And it was so interesting because they talked about how, you know, when we, when we talk to our friends, so they encouraged everyone to talk about this deeply weird election, you know. Yes, Biden. It's probably going to be Biden and Trump again, two very old candidates. And they, and even though we are very divided, they they kept on saying it's very important to talk about it. And and the problem, the reason why we end up fighting is because you go into conversations, you know, convinced you're going to persuade someone, you're going to convince someone. Oh, I gave up on that. You know. Ago. <laughs> You turn someone from Trump to Biden, Biden to Trump, Democrat to Republican, whatever you want to call it. But they said that's not the goal. The goal is to understand each other. The goal is to understand the other person's point of view. And at the right moment later on, it's like almost a long-term play, then you will influence them. You know, I, can I tell you something? I love this idea. I am going to try, I really am tonight, to talk to somebody who's supporting, I don't know, a rapist and a guy who committed a half-billion-dollar fraud and who has 91 indictments. I'm going to talk to that person and see if we can find some common okay. ground. So, so you know, what, you, what they would say is that you need say? to understand their point of view. And yeah. at the right moment... I do understand their point of view. Right. At the right moment, turn them. Try to convince them that they're wrong. Okay. Yeah, okay. I surely... And it's dro this week's has dropped. Yes, yesterday? It dropped yesterday. Say hi to the kids. It's great to see you, Shirley Leung. Thanks for having me. And tell us again what the series is on Sunday. I'm oh, sorry, what's it called? Reimagining Downtown. Reimagining Downtown. in the Globe great, Idea section. Great, fabulous. And Thank we'll you. listen to Say More wherever we get our podcasts. We will indeed. We've been speaking with Shirley Leung, Boston Globe business columnist, weekly BPR contributor, and the host of, as I just said, the Say More podcast with Shirley Leung. After a quick break, we're extending this conversation about the future of downtown Boston, open Opening things up to you. If you live in the city, what would you love to see in the downtown areas? Are you, and you people outside of the city, excuse me, what would it take to get you to come back downtown? You're listening to Boston Public Radio, 89.7 GBH. Welcome back to Boston Public Radio. Jim Browdy, Andrew Cabral sitting in for Marjorie. Marjorie will be back on Monday. We're obviously at the Boston Public Library. Till the end of the show, we're talking about an issue we were just discussing with Shirley, a business columnist for the Globe, Shirley Young, off this 10-part Globe series on what we need to do to revitalize downtown Boston and get you to use downtown Boston. We heard what Shirley thinks. We heard what Joan Venaki wrote about. What a bunch of... Did we talk about the kids at the Richard J. Murphy? Yes. That they're, was they're the, the ones that want... Yep, okay. and they also want the cat cafes. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, now it's time to hear from you. What do you think the city is missing? And what's the thing they could do other than more floating clown heads, which would be perfectly <laughs> fine with me? What would they do to get you here when otherwise you would not be here? Did I say that right? Yes, I did. 877-301. <laughs> 
8970. What would get you here? So list a couple of things yourself. What would get you? Do you use downtown Boston during the week? Not nearly as much as I uh, did before I was sort of retired. Mm -hmm. um, but people have you long... You are not retired. I mean, you're I'm not... Semi-retired. Well, semi. But go ahead. Okay. What is this? Hoping to be fully. Okay, um, go ahead. But, but people have long, you know, thought of downtown as a place where you go if you're, you know, working. Yep. Or you might have to come into the city. Like, it's over a million people that come into the city for one thing uh -huh. or another every single uh, day. Still? Well, probably not still. Okay. Um, but that was, a, that was sort of our high number. And, but you leave because there's nothing to do and no reason, unless you're gonna have dinner, you might go to a, you know, a restaurant or you might you know, go to a bar or something. But it's not, it's like our downtown is like, uh, like Australia has a thing called the Australian Capital Territory in addition to the four states. What is that? It's just, it's a government center. It literally is the center of their government. And it, it rolls up the sidewalks at five o'clock. Well, and what does that mean? That nothing happens there? Because the government is closed at five o'clock. Okay. There's no reason to stay there. And our downtown was a lot like that, is, is that you didn't have, it didn't, it didn't have enough draws to it. So most people weren't, weren't, coming and staying. Um, and that's what the, and since the pandemic, it's been even much worse because you don't even, you don't even uh, uh, have people coming in for work anymore. So this revitalization is a big deal and it really is an opportunity that I hope the city takes advantage of and uses all the creativity that, all the creative ideas that, that are gonna come well, in. Well, Wu's pretty creative. You know, our number is 877-301-8970. Even if it's a wacky kind of idea, if it would lure you, give us a buzz or a text. You know, I was talking before about closing down Copley, and there's some, I, know, I, I believe the Wu administration is still looking at it, but you know, it just occurred to me as I was talking, when you mentioned the Australian closed it down at five o'clock, why couldn't parts of the city stay open, but the streets close down? at five o'clock. Meaning if people are concerned about getting around during a business, or six o'clock or whatever, take Copley, take Newbury, not just on those Sundays or weekends or whatever, let there be pieces of the city, go into JP, go into Roxbury, wherever it is, where there are desirable venues, where you shut them down at the end of small or large so business or government day. So they have to use public day. transportation to get there? Well, to the, or you drive to the outskirts of that thing. For example, if Copley were, I haven't thought this through as much as I should, obviously. If Copley were closed, well, you couldn't drive down, what is the next street over? Is that exit, is that Dartmouth over there? It is Dartmouth over there. Dartmouth on one side. You couldn't drive over Dartmouth, so you drive to the end of Dartmouth, a block or so away, and then maybe actually walk. Why are you making a face at me? Look, Be walk because a little bit. The, I, I don't disagree with you, but immediately all of the people in the South End who've lived there for years and can't find a place to park even when the streets were open are going to say, you know how many people are coming in from the suburbs and are parking in front of my house and now I can't, that's... that's you know what they said? They said that about closing Newbury Street. You've been right. on Newbury Street when it's yeah. closed. How great is that? Yeah. And all we need to add is uh, But Newbury Street drinks. has less residential. To That's be true. fair, it has less residential than... The South End is, is pretty residential. Let's go to Joan in Lexington. What's your idea? What would get you downtown, Joan? Welcome. Hi. While I was listening, I thought of if the Museum of Fine Arts had like a satellite museum, maybe with sculpture, if it was a big space, and... But it could also be art, not necessarily the museum, but other spaces could be for artist studios. I think the town of Pittsfield had storefronts that they lent to artists That's to great. revitalize their downtown. I love that. I love that. that is, like you go to Soa and you can go in right. all those galleries and those buildings, but put them in storefronts. It's basically it's open brilliant. studios. Joan, thank you. It's basically a version of open studios, but having it on a consistent basis. It's not just like one time every six months. I like it a lot. Joan, thanks for the call. 877-301-8970. I have to laugh at this. So Ron from Westport, Massachusetts What's he <laughs> says, say? correct me if I'm wrong, but I can remember downtown Boston crawling with rats at night. I would come if there were less rats. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so for Ron, for people who are listening, if you want to get Ron into the city, his his threshold is less rats. When was the last time you saw a rat in down, downtown Boston? And I've seen him in a, behind a couple of they, restaurants. They're here definitely and there. there. I mean, like I've had people who've come into the city who, who are visiting who say, "I was yeah. walking down the street and this thing." What, you know, ran across my path and it was giant and I thought it was a cat, but it wasn't. Well, just pretend it's a cat and then you don't have to, I mean, you really don't have to worry about it. 877-301-8970. You know what the thing I don't understand is that maybe it's zoning, maybe it's things like it Shirley said, the drinks require, drinks, being able to drink on the street may require the state legislature. Uh, I'll take, off, I'll take I, open, open container over open carry, I'll tell you that. that. That's a good line. Do people know, oh, I hope people know. Thank you. 
Three people support that? At least three that? people support me. That is me. a pathetic response. We all support it is what they meant to say. Uh, what it was like, oh, what's the inhibitor? I find Wu, whether you like what she's doing, a pretty bold person, yeah. yes. willing to do things. Occasionally she has to backtrack, like the O'Brien thing we talked about a couple of days ago. Why aren't all these things happening if it turns out I assume the city council would be mostly right. supportive. Well, the wheels of government turn exceedingly slow, like the wheels of justice. Um, but, you know, and, and it is, Boston is a, a city of neighborhoods. And any time you're going to do anything like that, with the exception of downtown proper, any time you're going to do... But that's where the biggest problem is right now, is right. downtown proper. Right, but, it, but it, you know what happens when you don't sort of involve everybody in the decision and it's not, you know, as vetted as it possibly could be. I happen to agree with you. I think that at the mayoral level, executive action is probably a good idea um, because you can get bogged down in all of the people, uh, people's various objections to different things. Um, but, this, but you're right. It, some of it is messaging, too. Some of it is making, before you do something like this, doing all of the upfront work to say to people, look at how exciting this would be if we did it. And this is how necessary it is. And this is the kind of city we could be. I think sometimes that's missing as you well. You know, I just realized, I don't know if it's open right now because we're at the end of winter, even though today is the first day of meteorological spring. I don't even know what that means, but it is the first day of meteorological uh, spring. What's the name of that beer garden that's at the corner of Boylston and Tremont? Whatever it is, uh, if you drive by there on a nice night, like at six or seven, it is pat People cannot move, and obviously they're pretty excited to be there. That's another kind of thing. Right. Sure. And that got licensed. Let's go to Rob in a car. What would lure you downtown, Rob in a car? Hi. Hi, Rob. I think it. Hi. I think it uh, comes down to access. It's it's parking, parking, parking. That is and, a very and I think good that's point. A big deterrent. And the infrastructure that we have in Boston just doesn't support that and every building that's put up doesn't offset the parking that it takes. It's, it just it's a good point. It. It's true. Well, let me say something that I, uh, I uh, broach with great trepidation. How about taking the T? And nowadays, I think people want their own vehicle, get to, get to a place, get out, get in back into their own vehicle and, and be safe, not on the T where they're not guaranteed even arrival time or, <laughs> or even or arrival at all i thought it was your point <laughs> hey rob thank right. you for the call that beer garden is trillium a garden thank you for whoever uh, passed that along well, jane is texting us and she agrees with rob she says i live in say? cambridge i go to boston a lot more frequently if the tea were quicker and more reliable and if parking was more available and cheaper and of course she says and if it wasn't so damn cold she says she rides a bike all the time in the in good weather it's not I mean, cold anymore i mean that's not and uh, sadly it is not i don't hate cold weather but sadly for you know climate reasons it's not cold in boston anymore. well it would be great to see people make use of all of the uh newly installed bike lanes around the city and actually bike into the places like the trillium that you're talking about well and another thing I, again i'm sure i'm going to regret this one too why can't parking after business hours be free or reduce rates. We're going to talk about surge pricing. We didn't get to it at Wendy's, which right. existed for a nanosecond and then they pulled it back. Why can't there be non-surge parking rates in Boston they, so that that guy can do it? There yeah. could be, yeah. Well, okay, where do you want to go? Uh, let's talk to Ann in Newburyport. Hi, Ann. Hi. Hi. I think it, <laughs> this is a great idea. And I'm somebody that needs to be lured into Boston. But when I, uh, I went and heard you and Marjorie at the uh, library, that was highlight of my month. You did? But I think it was... Library's yeah. great. It's great. It's great. I'm it glad was, you came. And you have another day. But what I'd like is to see, um, you know, this is an area of numbers of musicians, uh, music schools great and so idea. on. And you have live music on street court. Great idea. Berkeley's right here. It's and right, literally right here. Yeah, but Ann, for musicians to play, they need an audience. I love that idea. Well, I guess they, they which comes first, as they say. If well, they're musicians. Play and then they come. Yeah. You're right. If you play it, they will come. I'm That's with true. you. I love that idea. Thank you, uh, 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 Ann. Candace from Somerville texted, she would like to bring back folk dancing in Copley Square. What does bring back folk dancing mean? Was like there when, folk when, dance? There must when have been. If she, she's dancing? saying that she wants to bring it back. Candace, text us again, will you? And let us know when there was folk dancing in Copley Square. If that'll bring people, I'm fine with that uh, too. One of, the, one of the good suggestions in um, uh, Shirley's column was 
you know, creating a pop-up grant program, pop-up store grant program. So pop-up stores draw tons of people mm -hmm. depending on what kind of stores yeah. they are. Yeah. So you basically have these downtown spaces. You either give them the upfront money to or rent free for six months. They do pop-ups and they're on a trial basis for six months and you see how many people they bring in, but you could rotate them fairly consistently so that you'd have a constant stream of folks. What was your answer when I asked you 10 minutes ago, what was the number one thing that would lure you? Did you answer the question? I can't remember. Oh, no, no, no. What, what, I mean, what, what, what would it be? It's a good question. Well, that is a problem. I think the, f we have a lot of festivals in outerlying areas. Boston festivals would be good. I love the live music, um, especially if it were folks from Berkeley, and that would be great. I would come downtown for that. Food on the street is what would lure me. High quality. Not like, do you ever go to New York City and eat a Sabret's hot dog? Is that, people I've, know ha what a I've had a Sabret's hot, hot dog, yes. Sabret's hot dogs are on the corner of most of uh, Manhattan. And when they pull the Sabrett's hot dog, that's a brand, out of the thing, it is as likely to be green as it is red. They are, it's really foul. But that's not high quality stuff. High quality, like food trucks, are, uh, how much you love food, you like food trucks? Yeah, they're, they're very, most people who work downtown like food trucks. It's much easier to run out and get something great for lunch from a food truck. More of that, I'm totally into that too. Let's go to Valerie, Valerie. in Situate. Hey there. Hi. Hi. So I have a lot of grandchildren and nieces and nephews, and they range from 1 to 14. Yeah. And I would love to bring them in town and be able to park in the building that's been renovated to ha that's downtown, that um, I park in the building and I go into the building and we pay one entry fee per kid. And it's for all these different assortment of activities like, I don't know, paintball and climbing walls and doing art activities and all that kind of thing. And then in the summertime, they have a tent outside for other activities. And it's just, it would be so much fun. But just like someone else said, we need to have parking that's... Um, downtown and or a tea that's more dependable and yes and it it could just be part of the renovations for the buildings that are um empty right now brilliant valerie thank you i love that thanks the, valerie zoe writes us a note and says our co-worker the rose kennedy greenway in the summer is a wealth of food yep, trucks it does. for people who work along or visit along the waterfront no and it's really Boston. it's profit it's great for the people who buy the food and it's in, it's immensely profitable for the people who have the trucks no it's but it is one. a draw you're right you often see incredibly long lines at popular food truck kind of things right right okay so we have time play for one more where do you want to okay go? let's try harry who's in quincy Hi, Harry. Hey, Harry. Hi there. Hi, how are you today? Excellent. Um, my, my one question is, since there are so many um, large buildings downtown that are not being used and have not been used for years, according to the eight years that I've been here, yeah. why can't they take those by eminent domain and turn those into parking for residents, get the residents' cars off the streets, and take another half of them and turn them into low-income mixed-use housing. So let's see if I know any good lawyers. In the, oh, one's right there. Well, What's the answer on eminent domain? Well, you can only you can you can you could take them by eminent domain, but they're all owned by someone, and they are buildings that, while not particularly profitable currently, might become profitable, and as long as people are paying their taxes. Um, that's going to be a huge fight, and it's going to be a, almost a building by building fight mm -hmm. where people are suing you individually. That might be a, a usually when it's something's taken by eminent domain, it's taken because they're going to put a highway through, or they're going to. No, you I understand know, that. It, it's sort of the nature of the project. It's not that it's not worth, certainly not, you know, worth, it's worth considering. I just think in terms of the legal fight and the delay, it might be somewhat onerous. Here is probably the wisest suggestion we've gotten and the most valuable one. This is an anonymous texter. If the T provided life jackets for people who have to jump off the orange line when it catches fire, that would be huge. I mean, would that not make it much more likely you'd ride the T to downtown? Thank you. I don't think that would engender a great deal of confidence. I think, no. it, I think it may. Uh, and we can, we can, we do have time for one more. So uh, in Brighton, just tell us. Bob and Gloucester, uh, you have 30 seconds, Bob. Take it away. Hey, Bob. Oh, uh, yeah, I'd like uh, anything that's free. <laughs> huh? Uh, years no, years free ago. is big. Yeah, every anything. time Jared's on the show, he mentions every museum that's got a free whatever. But go ahead. Yes, yes. I, I, Willie Nelson was in uh, Boston Common oh, 30 or 40 years ago, and it was 
a big crowd that was spread out throughout the whole common. You could hear the music, and it was great. It was great. Well, I think every 40 years he should come back and do one, by the way. He's in his 90s right. now, and he's touring He'll with Bob Dylan, who's in his 80s. Hey, Bob, thank you very Thanks much. Thanks for the call, Bob. For the call. And before you say goodbye to everybody, you were fabulous the last couple of days, and thank, thank you, you for doing this. Can we hear it for Andrea Cabral, please? I was channeling Marjorie Egan so well, you kept calling me, Whoever Marjorie. you are, yeah, but you've been, you're great. Whoever you're really you great. Are. Go ahead. Thanks for listening to another edition of Boston Public Radio. Keep up with us 24-7 by way of our podcast. And tune in tomorrow, Marjorie the real Marjorie Monday, will be Monday, back. Monday, Monday. Oh, tune in Monday. I'm Monday. sorry. It's okay. Marjorie will be back. We've got former Boston Globe editor, now head of the BU Journalism Program, Brian McGorry, the Ground Truth Project's Charlie Sinnott, investigative reporter Susan Zalkine on her new book, The Waltham Murders, One Woman's Pursuit to Expose the Truth Behind a Murder and a National Tragedy, plus the Revs, Irene Monroe and Emmett G. Price III, and presidential inaugural poet Richard Blanco will be here. Our crew is Zoe Matthews, Aidan Connolly, Nicole Garcia, and Hannah Loss, with additional support from Ethan Cutler. Our engineer is John, John the Claw Parker, and our executive producer is Jamie Bologna. They are a fabulous, fabulous team. On site help at BPL today came from Matthew Glover, Maddie Geyer, Sandra Lopez Burke, Isabella Carone, and Carly Corcoran. Stay tuned. Culture Show will be right here on 89.7 GBH, right after NPR and the local news. I'm Andrea Cabral. And thank you all for coming. We really appreciate it. I am Jim Browdy. Have a wonderful weekend, and we'll see you on Monday.